It is eight o'clock, so we're going to get started. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, the first item on the uh, agenda, and um, our healthcare advocate has already taken advantage of it. We're going to invoke uh, GMCB rule number one trillion and ninety H, and not require any jackets for this hearing. So we'll get rid of that. The second item of business. is making sure that uh, everyone who's tuned in knows that there's a public hearing tomorrow from four to six. And we look forward to uh, hearing people's thoughts on not only MVP submission, but also on the Blue Cross hearing from uh, Monday. So with that, I'm going to appoint Michael Barber as the hearing officer and turn the meeting over to him, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Michael Barber, General Counsel for the board. Uh, as you heard, I've been designated uh, to serve as the hearing, hearing officer for today's hearing. The purpose of this hearing is to take evidence and argument on MVP Health Plan's 2023 individual and small group rate filings. The docket numbers for these cases are GMCB-005-22RR and GMCB-006-22RR. The hearing is being held pursuant to 8 VSA 4062. Uh, representing MVP today are Gary Carnady, Ryan Long, and Alice McDermott from the law firm of Primer Piper, Eggleston and Kramer PC. Do you have anyone else uh, with you, Gary, or did I get everybody? That's everyone. Thank you. Representing the Office of the Healthcare Advocate today are Jay Angoff from the law firm Marion Scallett, PLLC, as well as HCA attorneys Eric Schulteis and Charles Becker. Uh, the board's attorney, Laura Beliveau, is also with us and will be questioning witnesses today. Because we're holding the hearing remotely, um, and I apparently did have a couple some technical issues uh, on Monday, I did just want to take a minute to make sure that uh, folks can hear me and that we can hear everyone else. So uh, just bear with me for a minute, but I'm going to call on the board members, the attorneys, and the court reporter just to make sure that we're not having any issues. Um, so, Mr. Mr. Chair, can you so hear me? So, Mike, okay? uh, the good news is that I can hear you loud and clear, unlike Monday when you were very quiet. Uh, today, you're coming through very, very succinctly. Thank you. Sure. I, I figured out I had a big uh, exhibit binder in front of my microphone. So, um, Board Member Holmes. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Board Member Lunge. Hi, Mike. Board Member Pelham. Uh, I got you stirred up on 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 Monday, so I can hear you loud and clear today. <laughs> yeah, yes, I can hear you. Great. Uh, board Member Walsh. Good morning. All clear. Great. Miss Bellavo. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Carnegie. Yes. Good morning. I can hear you fine. Thank you. Mr. Angoff? Yeah, Mike, I can hear you fine. I hope everyone can hear me and that there's no annoying echo. I don't hear an echo. Um, and Mr. Miller? Much better today. Great. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, we are recording today's hearing uh, via Teams. We also, as you know, have a court reporter here to transcribe the proceedings. We will provide uh, the parties with a copy of the transcript as soon as we receive it. Um, I expect that to be uh, early next week. Um, for members of the public who are present, uh, we will be taking public comment at the close of today's proceedings. Uh, I don't know when that will be, um, so if you don't want to sit through a long day of witness testimony. As the chair mentioned at the beginning, we are holding um, a hearing, a meeting, 
uh, this Thursday from four o'clock to six o'clock in the afternoon, specifically to take comments from members of the public on the hearings, on the rate filings from both carriers. Um, uh, so again, four o'clock to six o'clock on Thursday, information about how to attend that meeting can be found by going to the Green Mountain Care Board's website. I'm getting some feedback from um, an 845494 number. Okay. Uh, so if, uh, if you go to our website, the rate review tab has information about how to um, attend that meeting. Um, and just a reminder to the board and the parties before we begin to exercise caution um, regarding information in the binders that's been marked as confidential, um, as those matters can't be discussed in a public setting. <clears throat> and if it becomes necessary to discuss confidential materials, we do have a, a separate phone line um, if we need to go into executive session to do that. So let me just spend a minute on the binders. Um, we received exhibit binders on July 14th with 34 exhibits, exhibits one through 33 and it exhibit A. Um, as I understand it, exhibits one through 33 were stipulated to by the parties. Exhibit A was not stipulated to. On July 19th, we received nine additional exhibits, exhibits 34 through 42. I understand those have also been stipulated to. And then uh, also on July 19th, um, we discovered uh, that exhibits four and five uh, were incomplete and needed to be supplemented. And uh, there was two additional exhibits added, 43 and 44, which were responses to objection letter six in both filings. Uh, and I understand that has all been stipulated to as well. So to recap for folks, you should have a binder with 44 exhibits, I believe. Uh, exhibits 1 through 33 were in the original binders in the in exhibit A, and then the rest came via email. Um, does anyone not have all that material or have any questions about that? OK. So then I assume neither party objects to me admitting exhibits one through 44 into evidence at this time. Mr. Carnegie, any objection? No objection. Mr. Angoff, any objection? Uh, you are on mute. Sorry, no objection. OK, thank you. Then consider that done. Um, and then I understand there are objections to exhibit A and I. <clears throat> we should probably address those now. Does that work, Gary? That's fine. Thank you. Uh, well, first, I'd like to say that, uh, yes, we have a dispute on, on one exhibit. I'm going to argue why that exhibit shouldn't be admitted, but we agreed on 44 exhibits. So I think that the healthcare advocate and MVP over the years, we've uh, uh, been able to really uh, focus on solutions on all these exhibits, and we apologize for all the exhibits in advance to the board, but I think it'll be helpful as we go through the testimony. So uh, let's talk about our respectful disagreement. <coughs> so exhibit A is in your binder, and there's an A on it. If you would just turn to the first page of it, I have a copy here. Uh, exhibit A, is the 2021 Vermont Household Survey from the Department of Health. It's a 164 page report. And if you look at that first page, it's prepared by Market Decisions Research, which is out of Portland, Maine. And the authors of the report, as you can see on that first page, are Dr. Brian Robertson, uh, Mark Noyes, 
and in Anna Driscoll. So we object to this uh, exhibit going into evidence on three grounds. First, uh, this is an expert report prepared by an expert consultant who the HCA did not disclose pursuant to our scheduling order. We have a specific requirement in the scheduling order uh, to disclose experts by May 31st. Dr. Robertson was not disclosed and therefore this expert report should not be allowed into evidence. Second, the opinions and statements in the report should not be <coughs> without the witness being live here so I can cross-examine them. Accepting the report into evidence amounts to accepting testimony outside of the hearing. Green Mountain Care Board Rule 2307E1 provides that the chair shall administer an oath or affirmation to any witness before the witness testifies. Rule 2307E2 provides the chair shall permit a party to conduct a reasonable cross-examination of any witness upon request. Rule 2307D2 provides that any testimony is, that is not provided under oath shall not be considered for the truth of the matter asserted. Uh, that means hearsay is not allowed. Similarly, as a general rule, uh, expert written reports are hearsay and inadmissible in evidence in Vermont courts. The opinions uh, need to be presented via sworn testimony and the expert be present. Rule 702 of the Rules of Evidence only authorizes the introduction of an expert opinion in the form of, quote, testimony. The Vermont Supreme Court has ruled in numerous cases that non-testifying experts' opinions amount to hearsay and are inadmissible. I would make a proffer. If you go to the first page of Dr. Robertson's website, the Market Decisions Research website, it states Dr. Robertson provides technical leadership for all market decisions research projects, including research design, survey structure, sampling methodologies, uh, data collection methods, and analysis. He ensures that data collected is truly representative of the population of interest. Advanced tools are used to get the most from the data, and the data presented is clear and actionable. So Dr. Robertson is not here today to present his testimony. I'd like to ask him questions about his uh, methodology, about his conclusions, and cross-examine it. Further, you should follow your own precedent. The board is consistently required the carriers and the HCA to bring their witnesses to testify, the expert actuaries. In previous years, the HCA has had, this was before Jay's time, but they had an expert actuary come and testify. They were required to testify so I could cross-examine them. Similarly, Mr. Pontiff, my witness today, he's an expert. He's going to be testifying for probably three hours or more on the rate filings, on which is an expert report, answering the HCA's cross-examination questions and questions from the board about his opinions. Similarly, Ms. Lee has submitted an actuarial memorandum, but she's here so she can be cross-examined by me and the HCA about the opinions contained in that document. So, as I said before, Dr. Robertson's not available here for me to ask some questions, and it doesn't really allow for a level of playing field in any kind of battle with the experts. Uh, the third point would be that uh, if this report is admitted, I think it creates a prejudice for MVP and it's confusing. The report is based on surveys of people in Vermont. It's not based on actual historical data from MVP's membership. It talks about healthcare utilization, monthly premiums, and deductibles. They're all discussed in the survey. Uh, the actual experts, Mr. Pontiff, Ms. Lee, aren't relying on surveys. They're relying on actual MVP data. <coughs> so Dr. Robertson's opinions, I think, can be confusing on issues that are material uh, to this hearing. Now, I, I anticipate that opposing counsel will uh, point out that there was a report last year that was allowed into evidence. And I would submit that last year uh, that report was not prepared by an outside, outside expert consultant. Doubling link, a lot more objectionable information here. And finally, uh, I didn't object to it because for that reason it was you know, a different document because there was this outside expert. So we would move that the uh, exhibit not be allowed into evidence. Thank you. So I just want to first correct one factual error. For my entire time in Vermont, 
So this report and the last report, market research has been the contractor hired by DOH to summarize the results of the Vermont Household Health Information Survey. Contrary to Mr. Carnegie's uh, assertions, I would respectfully submit that this is not an expert in this case. Rather, this is a report produced by the Vermont Department of Health. The veracity of it cannot be reasonably questioned, and it is clearly relevant in the present case as it speaks directly to the statutory criteria of affordability and access. Lastly, I will note that in every past rate review that I've been part of, the board has admitted said document with no objection from the board. I ask that the board take administrative notice of this document as it is empowered to do. Thank you. I have a question for the HCA. Do you plan on asking witnesses questions about this document at the hearing, or is this uh, more for briefing? I'm yeah. just wondering what. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Hearing Officer. I don't plan on asking the witness asking questions about this document. May May I respond? Go ahead. Uh, just to be clear, I have last year's exhibit, uh, and there's no reference on the exhibit to market decisions research. And I don't think the point is whether they ask a question. The point is you're putting in expert opinions that they can then uh, rely on in their briefing, and the board can consider it. So I just go back to my earlier points. Sure. And and the reason I asked the question is because uh, I would like to give it a little thought before I make uh, a decision. Um, and I'm wondering whether I need to make the decision at this point or whether I can defer that decision to either the conclusion of the hearing or after that, probably the conclusion of the hearing. So that that was the purpose of the question. Um, I have no objection to you deferring it. That's fine. Nor do I. I have no. Sorry, I didn't hear that, Jay. Yes, the HCA does not have any objection to this question being deferred. Okay. Any further argument? I, I, I think I will take this up at the close of the hearing. Um, any further argument from the parties on the admissibility? No, other than if you want to defer until you saw the record, some things I cited, that's fine, but it's actually up to you. I, I would just like to make one last point that um, Attorney Carnegie referenced that this does not um, incorporate experience data for MVP. It does speak to our community directly and to Vermont, and it is the best data source we have produced by the government about the people of Vermont, which MVP serves. Yes, do you have a response to MVP's assertion that this is expert testimony? I, I mean, sorry, expert, expert report. So again, I would argue that that's a mischaracterization. It's a government report. It's always been produced by the same or last year it was produced, last time it was produced by the same contractor. It's released by DOH. It's a government report, and that Attorney Carnegie is mischaracterizing it as an expert report prepared for this hearing, which it is not. I didn't say it was prepared for the hearing. It's certainly uh, a PhD. Dr. Brian Robertson's the author of the report. The balance is, is up to the hearing officer and how you want to uh, Decide, but this is clearly opinions of an expert. I presume that the state of Vermont isn't going to hire somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. This is an expert survey. Okay. All right. Well, um, we will take this up at the close of the hearing. Um, and 
appreciate the arguments of the parties on that. Um, so if there's nothing else on this at this time, then I think we can move to opening statements. Um, Gary, you can go first if you'd like to take a minute. Or Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm ready to roll here. Good morning. I guess you already know my name is Gary Carnady, and uh, I'm here again representing MVP, uh, along with Ryan Long and Alice McDermott in the 2023 rate filings for individual and small group. Uh, the evidence will show that MVP is seeking a 24.5% average rate increase for individuals and 23.44% increase for small group. I think this year there are three primary issues for the board to consider in setting MVP's rates. First is medical trend and increases proposed by the hospitals in the recent budget submissions. Those submissions will have a significant impact to MVP's rate filings this year. This past week, the last of the hospital's budgets were submitted uh, by the hospitals. Per the board, the weighted average increase is 10.66% and a 16.3% commercial approved effective rate. Those hospital budgets upended MVP's original rate filing. And the evidence will show that the proposed hospital budgets, if approved, have a significant impact on these rates initially proposed by MVP, adding another just over 7% to the requested increase for individual and small group. As you know, the board's charge is to ensure that Vermonters have the insurance necessary to pay for such hospital budget increases. Again, in this year's MVP rate filing, excuse me, rate filing hearing, the board has to anticipate what it will decide at the hospital budget hearings. As you know, those hearings take place after the record is closed in this case. You will hear evidence that will guide the board to exercise its discretion in our case, consistently and reasonably based on evidence. The board, of course, needs to make sure the decision is based on evidence and not speculative. In short, medical unit cost trend should be recognized and included in the final approved rate increase of MVP. We believe the second primary issue for this year is contributions to reserves. The evidence will show that the board should be steadfast in adopting MVP's proposed CTR of 1.5% without modification. The evidence will show that this is not a year to cut MVP's CTR below 1.5%. The evidence will show that MVP had significant losses last year. I quote l &E in his actuarial memorandum. l &E notes that it is not sustainable to have long-term negative profits and therefore a higher CTR may be justified. This concern raised by l and &E in its actuarial memorandum is well-founded. If significant losses continue into 2023 and beyond, board cuts to CTR are simply not sustainable. Third, we have dis two disagreements with l and &E this year on MVP's proposed rate increase. One is on the COVID-19 vaccine adjustment. l and &E would uh, reduce MVP figure by 0.6 for individual and 0.7 for small group. And the second disagreement with l and &E this year is on an adjustment for large claims where they would reduce MVP's requested increase by 0.7 for individual and 0.9 for small group. We respectfully disagree with l and &E on these two issues and you will hear evidence on, on those issues as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carnegie. Mr. Angoff, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I have a soft spot for MVP. And the reason I have a soft spot for MVP is there's no sanctimoniousness on the part of MVP. There's no whining. They just come in and they ask you for a big rate increase. Now, I think that big rate increase is unjustified. I think the evidence will show it's unjustified, but I appreciate their style. I don't appreciate that in, in certain cases, the boards ask them questions and they've essentially, got, gone, they've essentially told the board to pound sand 
And I'll point those out too. And I hope that MVP at this, at this hearing will answer those questions. I'd like to make four points that I think are important about uh, the testimony you're going to hear. Number one, you're going to hear a lot of testimony about all the things that MVP has tried to do to make rates affordable. And that's great. That's admirable. But that's not the standard in the statute. The statute says the board must consider whether the rate is affordable, not whether MVP has tried to make rates affordable. It looks only at the person, the policyholder. Can that person afford the premium? It's the exact opposite of the excessive, inadequate, and unfairly discriminatory standard. A lot of people, a lot of consumers don't get that that has nothing to do with whether the consumer can afford it. That has only to do with whether the premium taken in is the right amount uh, to cover the amount that the, uh, policy, the uh, insurance company will pay out. So a lot of the testimony that you're going to hear about affordability is irrelevant because it doesn't go to whether whether the individual policyholder can afford the uh, policy. Second point, in many cases, with the two exceptions that Mr. Carnegie pointed out, where and where L &E says MVP's assumptions are unreasonable, L&E &E doesn't say that MVP has picked the best, the, the best number for any element. It simply says that MVP's assumption is reasonable. There are many, many assumptions that are reasonable, and it's the board's uh, the board's authority to, within this zone of reasonableness, pick a number which maximizes, among other things, affordability. The fact that MVP and L and E agree that a number, one number, is reasonable, doesn't mean at all that there aren't several numbers that are not also reasonable. Third point, MVP is not a Vermont company. They're a New York company. That doesn't make them a bad company, but Vermont is a tiny teensy weensy tail of a much bigger company. Vermont business accounts, depending on which, how you measure it, from between 5% and 7.5% of MVP's total business. So last year, uh, yeah, in connection with last year's rate filing, the most recent year you all were considering in connection with last year's rate filing, MVP had a terrible, terrible year in New York, but a good year in Vermont. And all respect, I think that at least part of the rate increase that uh, MVP asked for and was granted for Vermonters really went to cover some of their losses in New York. So I think it's very important this year, what happened last year is over the dam or over the bridge or whatever the cliche is, but I think it, it's, it's very important this year to make sure that Vermonters are not subsidizing MVP's bad results in New York. And a fourth point, and this is related to the, uh, to the point I just made, MVP's RBC ratio is very low. I don't think dangerously low, but it's under 400. Now I forget what from uh, Blue, the Blue Cross proceeding is public and non-public, so I'm not going to mention any numbers, but you know that's far, far lower than Blue Cross's, uh, Blue Cross's RBC. And what, what you all do in connection with this little rate increase for a, a very small amount of MVP's uh, total premium, not going to have an effect on uh, one way or the other on MVP surplus and, and therefore an MVP's RBC ratio. But it's just something for the board to be, I think, to be cognizant of that MVP's uh, RBC ratio is low and has fallen uh, more than 50 points from last year. So those are my four substantive points, but I'd like to leave you with this. MVP is now saying essentially we know you all are going to 
allow the hospitals to charge us more. And therefore, we want you to allow us to charge consumers more. And my response to that is they need some tough love. Or, and I know all of you, with one possible exception, are much too young to remember this great zombie song from 1966, which goes, tell her no, 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 no. I think there's got to be some of that in order to benefit, in order to, this sounds too pat, but in order to tell consumers yes, you have to be able to tell the hospitals and the insurers no, at least to a certain extent. So I hope you'll uh, consider that in the spirit in which it was meant, and I look forward to the hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Angoff. Mr. Carney, are you prepared to call your first witness? I am, if you could just give me one moment. We'll call Chris Pontiff. Mr. Pontiff, I'm going to swear you in at this point. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Gary. Uh, did you know that song that Jay just referenced? I did not. Fair enough. <laughs> no, nor did I, Jay. I'm sorry. You're I'm old. I'm not old. Uh, Chris, would you state your full name for the board, please? Yes, Christopher Pontiff. And where do you work? I work at MVP Healthcare. And um, MVP Healthcare is your employer? That's correct. Okay, so the filing this year was filed by MVP Health Plan Inc. The two filings, I should say. Uh, what is MVP Health Plan Inc., please? That is the HMO subsidiary of MVP Healthcare. Okay, and what is your position at MVP, please? Director, Commercial Market Actuary. And are you a member of any professional associations, please? I am. I'm an associate of the Society of Actuaries as well as a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. And how long have you worked in the health insurance uh, industry? About five years. Okay, and that's been with MVP? It has. And uh, over those last five years, could you tell the board you, your involvement and the number of times that you've made filings in Vermont? Sure. So. Every each of the five years that I've worked at MVP, I have um, in some capacity prepared or um, oversaw the development of the small and individual rates as well as the large group rates. So this year we'll make about 10 filings in total that I've worked on for the state of Vermont. Okay. And you're you're taking over from Matt Lombardo is the is the witness in the hot seat today, correct? That is correct. What are your job duties at MVP? I oversee all commercial pricing for MVP, as well as corporate reserving and corporate forecasting for our commercial lines of business. And would that include setting IBNR? It would. And uh, reviewing uh, cost drivers? That's correct. What I want to do, uh, which I do each year, is acclimate you and the board to all these exhibits in the exhibit binder. Do you have that binder uh, handy? I do. Okay. And there's an exhibit list that we sent last night, the final exhibit list, which is three pages. Do you have that? I do. And uh, then there's uh, attached to it the non-stipulated exhibit list. We don't need to refer to that. So um, I just want to go through and get a sense of where things are and what we'll be talking about. So if you look at that, ex ex list uh, exhibits 1 through 7, 9 through 11, 17, and 20 would be exhibits that are our individual and small group rate filings, responses to objections, and you've reviewed them and are familiar with them and would adopt them as part of your testimony, correct? That's correct. 
And then exhibit eight, that's your CV, correct? Correct. And you prepared that? Correct. And then exhibit 16, going to the second page, that's your pre-filed testimony, uh, and you uh, reviewed that and are familiar with it, correct? Correct. And adopt that as your testimony here? I do. And then going back to exhibit 12 and 13, those are the L&E actuarial memorandums of July the 5th. You've reviewed those and are familiar with them, correct? That's correct. And we'll be referring a lot to Exhibit 12 in the hearing. Um, exhibits 14 and 15, those are the two DFR letters on solvency, correct? That's correct. Okay, and you re reviewed those and are familiar with them? That's correct. And then Exhibit 18, is MVP's calculation of LE's July 5th actuarial uh, memorandum, correct? Correct. And you prepared that and are familiar with it? Correct. Okay. And then Exhibit 19 is your supplemental pre filed of July the 11th. You're familiar with that, prepared it, correct? That's correct. And then Exhibit, we're up to the last exhibit in that first section, Exhibit 21, that's pre filed testimony of Jackie Lee. And you reviewed that and are familiar with it, correct? That's correct. And then I'd ask you to go, there's healthcare advocate exhibits, and then there's post binder additional stipulated exhibits. Do you see that? I do. Those are the exhibits that were distributed after we had already sent out the binders. Um, so let's go through those. Uh, 34 and 35 are res MVP's responses to objection eight, correct? Correct. Uh, 36 is a CDC Vermont vaccination rate document as of July 14th. Do you see that? I do. Um, 37 and 38 are MVP's responses to objection nine for individual and small group, correct? That's correct. Uh, exhibit 39 is July 18th. July 18th MVP updated rate increase summary table, correct? Correct. And 40 is uh, 40 and 41 are uh, tables that MVP prepared relating to the COVID vaccine adjustment and the historical large claim, correct? That is correct. And 42 is a document from last year's hearing, uh, the July 27, 2021 LE post report addendum on some historical analysis of possible budgets, correct? That's correct. And then finally, 43 and 44 is uh, MVP's responses to objection six, correct? Correct. Okay, so those that I identify that MVP prepared, you're familiar with those and help prepare those and include them as part of your testimony, correct? That's correct. And the other documents you've reviewed and are familiar with, correct? Correct. Next, I just, as a point of reference, if you would go to exhibit one, please, in the binder, and go to the very first page. And uh, just below the exhibit sticky, you see a, a Bates number, or it should be in red for people, but it's 001, do you see that? Yes. Uh, you cringe, is yours not in red, Chris? No, the first one's black, the rest of them are red. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay, okay. so. When we're talking about exhibits today and we talk about page numbers, um, I'll reference those Bates numbers. So it may be the Bates number rather than some other number on the page, but when we're just so people can acclimate themselves, we'll be referencing the Bates numbers. Okay. All right, Chris, I want to start with at a high level talking about the rate increase and identifying LE's recommendations. This is high level. We'll then get into substantive issues, which you can explain. Okay. So starting with the original filing, would you go to exhibit one, please? And this is the individual rate filing from uh, May, correct? That's correct. May 6th? Correct. And if you go to page two, that Bates number, the red number on the bottom, page two, um, and over under general information, what was the original rate request of MVP for the individual? 17.37%. Thank you. And then if you would go to exhibit two, please. 
Let me know when you're there. Okay, I'm there. And this is the rate filing for the Vermont small group of May the 6th, correct? That is correct. And if you go again to page two, and okay. this was this was in May, what was the overall rate impact uh, rate request of MVP for small group? 16.61%. Very good, thank you. Next, I'd ask you to go to the l &E report, which is exhibit 12, please. Exhibit 12. And Chair Mullen, just as a as a timing, I just want to make sure that board's getting to the exhibits. Have you have you gotten to that exhibit twelve? Are you there? Yes, I'm seeing nods. Thank you. Okay, so exhibit twelve. Um, this is the July fifth uh, actuarial memorandum of L and E. Correct. That's correct. So would you please go to page sixteen of the document? Page sixteen. <clears throat> Let me know when you're there. I'm there. And you'll see that there are recommendations and there are one, two, three, four, five bullets. Do you see that? I do. Going to the last sentence, please read the last sentence, not the footnote, but the last sentence on the bottom. After the modifications, the anticipated rate change for the individual market is roughly 16.0% plus any impact from the updated hospital budget information. Okay, so we just looked at the original filing uh, for individual and it was 17.37, correct? That's correct. And, and l and &E is recommending that that be reduced to 16. Is that correct, if you use straight subtraction? Yes. Would you please go to exhibit 13, please? Uh, this is Eleni's uh, actual memorandum for the small group filing, correct? That's correct. And same thing, if you can go to page 16 of that document. Okay. Um, uh, and there are, again, five recommendations. Please read the last sentence at the bottom. After the modifications, the anticipated rate change for the small group market is roughly 14.8%, plus any impact from the updated hospital budget information. Okay. So we just looked at the small group rate filing in May, and it was 16.6, .6, and Alan e is suggesting, uh, as of the date of this letter, a reduction to 14.8, correct? That's correct. And so what's the, uh, what's the difference, simple subtraction? Roughly 1.8%. Terrific, okay. So let's go back to exhibit 12. And go to those recommendations on page 16. And again, we're at a high level. I just wanna go through the five bullets with you and get a sense of what we agree on and what we don't. What's the first bullet about, and do we agree or disagree? Sure. The, the first bullet is l &E stating that they believe our initial estimation of the hospital budgets for 2023 is reasonable and appropriate, but once the 2023 budget requests are submitted, l &E recommends that that information be factored into the rate change. And we agree with that, correct? We do. Um, and we'll talk about uh, percentages and numbers later, but based on the hospital budgets, uh, what is the uh, adjustment roughly for each of the filings? It's, it's roughly, it's in the neighborhood of 7%. Thank you. Okay, second bullet. What is that and do we agree or disagree? The second bullet is Elney's recommendation that MVP remove the COVID vaccination adjustment that we made to the rates um, based on our projection of 2023 costs and that we use our experience period data trended to the projection period. We respectfully disagree with this recommendation. And they say that's a 
0.6 difference, if I'm reading that right. That's correct. Third bullet. The third bullet is is a procedural change to move a um, move a factor that was on page one of the URT or worksheet one of the URT rather, and um, represent that on worksheet two of the URT. We agree with this recommendation. It's it will better align the optics of the URT to the instructions and is has no impact on rates. It is a product of the difference between MVP's rate filing and the URT, but does not impact the rates themselves. The fourth bullet, what is it and do we agree or disagree? The fourth bullet is LNE's recommendation to update the rates to reflect the final risk adjustment transfer amounts. MVP agrees with these recommendation, this recommendation. And what does that uh, end up being in terms of the dec decrease in rates? It's a decrease of 0.1%. Thank you. And the last bullet, what is it and do we agree or disagree? The last bullet is l &E recommending that MVP's base period claims reflect a three-year average of claims above a, a high cost threshold. MVP respectfully disagrees with this adjustment as well. And uh, what do they indicate the amount of the disagreement is here? 0.7% decrease. Thank you. Okay. If you would go to exhibit 13, please. That's the small group filing. And I want to go to that recommendations page of LEs on page 16, please. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. It's the same five bullet headings, correct? That's correct. Okay. But there are a couple of uh, percentage numbers on some of these that are slightly different. Is that correct? That is. Okay. Would you identify those for the board, please? Yes. In bullet four, the risk adjustment transfers, it is a decrease of 0.3% in small group as compared to 0.1% in individual. And on the fifth bullet, the large claim adjustment, it's a, their recommendation is a 0.9 decrease um, as compared to a 0.7% decrease in individual. So small group on the large claim, they're saying they, our rate should be decreased by 0.9. Uh, for individual, it's 0.7. Is that correct? That is correct. And then for the risk adjustment, uh, it's rather than the 0.1 for individual, this is a 0.3 for the small group, correct? That's correct. Okay. So. Today, you'll be testifying about the rates, and I'll ask you questions about the rates. Uh, and rather than doing this bouncing back and forth all day between small group and individual, um, is it fair to say that your, your testimony responses to my questions and uh, others, I presume, uh, will be for both filings? Yes. So you'll tell me different if you need to uh, modify it as to the small group rate when we're talking about this stuff, correct? That's correct. Would you go to exhibit 18, please? Okay. Would you please just identify the document first? Just t tell the board what this is and, and what yeah. you yeah, this document is MVP's calculation of LE's recommendations. So it is not us agreeing or disagreeing with the recommendations themselves, but simply putting their recommendations into our rate filing and, and checking the um, the impact to the rates compared to LE's stated impacts. Okay, and this is something the board asks us to do, at least for the last several years we've been asked, correct? That's correct. And when you say put in the rate filing, you mean actually putting in the rate filing software to crunch the numbers that l and recommending, is that right? Correct. We, we place their recommendations in our rate filing, yes. So we're not, we're just, uh, this document reflects that we're agreeing on their math, not agreeing on their conclusions. Is that fair? Agreeing or disagreeing, but yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I misstated that. We're checking their math. We're not getting into actuarial opinions or things, correct? Correct. 
So would you please walk, and somewhat slowly, walk the board through the four items, please, and uh, sh show what you found in terms of the math and where there might be um, some differences. Sure. So for the first bullet um, concerning the COVID-19 vaccination adjustment, MVP agrees for the individual flying that it um, results in a 0.6% decrease. For the small group filing, L&E also stated 0.6, whereas MVP has calculated as a 0.7% decrease. So just a slight difference there. And the second bullet for the updated risk adjustment, MVP has no disagreements. We agree with both of the impacts for both filings. The third bullet, or the third point, um, the large claim adjustment, MVP, again, agrees with both of the quantifications by l &E. And the fourth piece is just the total rate change. Um, with all the adjustments, l &E calculated an increase of 16 for individual, whereas MVP calculated 15.7, and l &E calculated 14.8 for small group, and MVP calculated 14.5. This is largely due to the um, interactivity of assumptions that when you make multiple at the same time, it doesn't have a it doesn't have the sum of the independent um, adjustments. So there's just a slight difference, but nothing major. Terrific, thank you, Chris. Uh, now let's let's talk about the two areas of disagreement that we have with L and E. We'll start with it, the COVID vaccination adjustment. Um, if you go back to Exhibit 12, please, Exhibit 12. Okay, I think you just, oh, let me know when you're there. What page? Um, let's just go to the exhibit first. So on this one, you just talked about the calculations here. There was just the math difference where we uh, calculated a 0.7 on the small group, correct? And they said 0.6. Other than that, the math aligns, correct? Correct. Go to page eight, please, of the exhibit. And you'll see at the very bottom, there's a heading called COVID-19 vaccinations. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. Now, uh, this is the section where l &E talks about this COVID vaccination issue and the issue we disagree on, uh, correct? It goes into page nine. That's correct. So, uh, as I understand it, you have two subjects of dispute as it relates to uh, l &E's opinions on this, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, and what... Could you just identify those two and then we'll talk about it? Sure. The first being the utilization rate of the vaccine for, you know, percent of members getting vaccines. And the second being the unit cost of the vaccine. Okay. So let's start with that utilization then. Um, how did MVP consider vaccine utilization, please? Sure. So MVP's experience period data we believe is highly suppressed due to the mass vaccination sites that were available to members in 2021 where MVP did not get billed for these vaccinations. So MVP's experience period data shows a, a vaccination rate of 37%, meaning that 37% of our members received at least one vaccine, which we know is well below the Vermont one dose rate of about 95%. So there, there's, we are certain that the mass vaccination sites were, t were vaccinating our members at no cost MVP, which we're not complaining about, but those max vaccina vaccination sites are largely, um, go have gone away or are continuing to go away and the vaccines are now being billed to the insurers. So as a result, MVP chose to um, use a projection by CMS, a nationwide projection that used a utilization rate of 52% assumed for the booster shot. This is, we felt, an appropriate utiliz a utilization assumption because we know, we are unsure what the, the booster rate will be, but 
we know that Vermont Vermonters have been very good at getting vaccines and will likely be higher than the nationwide average. So we figured the CMS number would provide a good um, a good balance for that compared to our experience period data. So uh, the MVP uh, utilization figure, that's to be clear, that's when uh, an insurer comes to MVP and says, pay for my shot, correct? It's not whether they got a shot free or otherwise. It's, it's they come correct. and it's claimed, the, right? The 37% represents the members for which MVP has a vaccination claim in 2021. It does not represent the members who have been vaccinated. MVP has no insight into if a member went to a state-run or federally-run vaccination site and you know FEMA funds or any other type of government funds paid for those vaccinations. MVP does not get those records. And just to explain again, why is the CMS uh, figure what is the CMS figure again? What, what's the percentage? The, C, the CMS projection for 2023 vaccination cost is what CMS built in to, has published published um, publicly and built into their benchmark rates, which drives Medicare um, premiums. And we we believe, well, L&E did make the statement that that is probably more suited to the Medicare population. That's where we felt that the Vermont's, Vermonters being high, much higher national than the national average in vaccination rate is a little bit of an offset to that. And at the end of the day, we felt it was a better projection than using MVP's data alone because we know there's missing data in MVP's numbers. Fair enough. Would you go please to exhibit 36? 36? Let me know when you're there. I'm there. Okay, so this is a two-page document, correct? That's correct. So go to the first page and just identify the document, please. Yes, this is, um, I believe, two screenshots of a CDC website stating vaccinations, vaccination rates, and vaccination data. Okay, and down, it's hard to read. But you've got better eyes than me. But down on the bottom right-hand corner, right next to the Bates number, the 001, there's some dates and things. What does that say? Yes, it says data as of July 13th, 2022, and it was posted on their website July 14th, 2022. And above that, uh, to the right, if I'm reading it right, there's a number 78.5%. Do you see that? I do. What is that number? That is the nationwide number of a nationwide percentage of people who have at least one vaccination dose. Okay, one, vac one vaccination dose, correct? Correct. Okay. And then if you go to the second page of the exhibit, please. And what does this show, please? This is a map of the United States where it has a color shading for your percentage of people getting at least one dose of the vaccine, where Vermont is, I believe this is an interactive website where um, Vermont has been clicked on, so a little more information has been given, and Vermont's percent of the population receiving at least one dose is 95%. Okay, so to summarize, the uh, MVP uh, uh, rate for vaccination claims uh, it last year is 37%, correct? That's correct. And then the CMS figure is 52%, what they're projecting for next year, correct? That's correct. And then this exhibit shows that 95% uh, of Vermonters have gotten uh, one dose, 95%, correct? Correct. So based on, on that information, uh, as you sit here today, do you believe that the, using the 52% is reasonable? We believe the 52% is reasonable. As, as I stated earlier, we have little confidence in the accuracy of MVP's experience period vaccination data due to the mass vaccination sites. So we wanted to rely on um, a, a more standardized projection and, and feel of 
what you know the federal government has published that the cost would be in in 2023. Okay. And what about the notion of uh, uh, booster shots, subsequent shots? I, I think at this point nobody knows. I mean, it's it's been a discussion for this was a discussion for the past uh, two rate filings now of when will vac the first one was when will the vaccines be available? We had that discussion in mid 2020, um, and then last year it was how many booster shots, if any, and when are the booster shots going to be available? I still, I'm not a medical professional. I don't know the the science behind the you know effectiveness and length of these boosters. But everything that I hear at this point is it's going to be similar to a flu shot type of um, annual or semi-annual dose. So that's that's what we have. That's the information we have, and that's the information we have to go on. Thank you. So now let's talk about unit cost. That was the second issue I think you raised with uh, that we have a difference of opinion on the vaccination That's issue. Correct. Correct. What is MVP's position on unit costs and the basis for that position, please? MVP's position is is that in 2023, the cost to MVP for a vaccination will be $104. This is comprised of $40 administrative fee, which is what is the only thing MVP is currently paying, and then an additional $64 per shot for ingredient cost. Currently, the federal government is paying the ingredient cost, but that is um, according to publications and, and what we've um, heard, it's the federal funds are running short on that, and it is fully expected the carriers will be picking that up in the near future, as evidenced by CMS building that into their Medicare benchmark rates, which to us was a clear indication that the federal government expects insurers to be paying that in 2023, as that is a component of Medicare premiums that the government would not charge if they did not believe that was going to be um, a cost. So currently MVP's experience is roughly $40 per shot. As stated, I believe that's a, that's a federally set figure for administrative cost and we just believe that the extra $64 ingredient cost is going to come to MVP. We, we believe that as a matter of fact, not a uh, not speculation. Now, the speculation could be around whether it's going to be 65, 64, 75, 55. I think that's unknown at this time, but it will be an additional cost. And our, again, at this time, our best estimate is the, the federally published numbers for the expectation of the ingredient cost. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about LNE's position on unit costs. Would you go to Exhibit 40, please? Exhibit 40. Okay. I have to get there myself. Hold on a second. Here we go. Okay. So would you please? Uh, I identify these uh, documents generally. What what do we have here? Sure, we have two tables that are were developed to show what impact on the rates the essentially the shift in unit costs would have even if taking in MVP's utilization. So in LNE's recommendation, they Let me interrupt you for a second just so we can follow. So these are these are two tables that MVP prepared, correct? That's correct. Okay. And the purpose of these tables is to uh, quantify uh, even if uh, you uh, agreed with the utilization rate of l &E, this is how it would play out with the ingredient costs. Is that a fair summary or can you state that better, please? That That's generally correct. Essentially, these tables were created to show that if you take into account the projected increase in, in unit cost, that the utilization rate doesn't, even if you kept MVP's utilization rate, it would provide a, an increase to our initial proposed rates, not, not a decrease as l is suggesting. So it's just, you know, sim the math, you know, to put it simply is, we currently pay $40, we're projecting $104, so even if the amount of shots MVP has to pay is the same, that's an over doubling in cost, right? It's like a 2.5 almost in cost. So it 
there we are expecting a significant uptick in vaccination cost whether or not utilization is factored in so okay so the table is reflecting and then i want you to walk through the table even if you use the 30 per 37 percent uh mvp vaccination claims of, of last year even if you use the 37 percent uh this table reflects uh, uh if uh, that coupled with the unit cost being 104 what the impact would be correct correct and that was in LNE's recommendation, they they made the statement something like, "We believe MVP's experience period, um, you know, experience trended to the future is an is an appropriate approximation for the cost." And so we we said, "Okay, if we keep everything the same, but just change the unit cost because we believe that that is pretty a pretty firm um, projection, what would that result in?" And that results in a higher figure than the CMS projection that we initially state that we initially went with. Terrific, thank you. So uh, if you could walk me through on the left table, that's for individual market, correct? That's correct. Okay, so just walk through the MVP utilization column. Sure, so this, at the top, you can see our experience period cost of 265, that, that number doesn't change. Um, none of the other numbers are different than what we've provided in, in the objection and the data to l &E, except for the unit cost per shot goes from $40 essentially to $104, which you can see results in a projection period cost of $7 as where I believe the CMS projection was 631. So l &E is suggesting we use the 265 trended. We per initially proposed the 631, which we stand behind and still believe that's a reasonable approximation for the future, given the data quality issues. Um, but we just wanted to represent if using MVP's utilization and increasing the cost, you would also get to a figure in the neighborhood of the CMS projection. So it so shows the, the impact of the increased unit cost is really what we're trying to show here. And what is that last row then? Uh, what's the percentage? The percentage is 0.12%, and that's relative to our initial proposed rates. Okay. And then, uh, Similarly, you don't need to go through all the whole table, but just go to that last row on small group to the right. What's that yep. figure? 0.15%. And that's driven that's driven by a little bit higher um, utilization rate. Very good. Okay, thank you. I want to go to the second area of dispute which is on a large claim adjustment. So if you go back to exhibit 12, please. And go to page 16. Again. And the sixth bullet, this is this large claim adjustment disagreement. And uh, this individual filing exhibit 12 shows a 0.7 decrease and I believe uh, it you already testified it's 0.9 for small group correct that's correct and we confirm their math we don't agree with it the rationales but we confirm the math correct correct so if you go to page 11 please Let me know when you're there. I'm there. Okay, and see the fourth paragraph has a heading large claims adjustment. Do you see that? I do. So this is where l e talks about this issue of the large claims, correct? That's correct. Uh, so uh, do you have a disagreement with them on this? Yes. And uh, are there two areas of disagreement? That's correct. Would you first just identify the two areas of disagreement? Then we'll talk about it. Sure. The first area of disagreement is the general rationale for the um, adjustment. So just the, the reason behind making this type of adjustment. The second reason is, is more from a technical math standpoint of calculating the adjustment itself. We have some concerns with the math being used um, in such an adjustment. 
Okay, thank you. So let's talk about the first one. And then, then it's a difference, it's a difference of actuarial opinion, basically, correct? That's right. So uh, tell me about that. Uh, what do you believe is proper for large claims? Uh, and what does L&E believe? Sure. So in, in this recommendation, l &E is suggesting that MVP's 2021 claims, large claims above 200,000 are an outlier and that that should be replaced with the three-year average. This is in essence a smoothing technique, a pooling technique, you can use either word, to, to reduce fluctuation um, over time. MVP generally agrees that smoothing and pooling is a valid technique to use in certain circumstances. The circumstance for that is fluctuation over time of claims. MVP does not see what's happening in our Vermont block of business as a fluctuation of high cost claims, rather an increase to high cost claims. You can see starting from 2018, it's a steady increase. In 2021, in our emerging experience in 2022, tells no different. Um, and we, can I interrupt for a second? Are you are you referring to that table on page 11? I am. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So that table shows a steady increase. And MVP believes that pooling or smoothing data that's continually increasing is not reducing historical, is not reducing fluctuations in the future based on historical data. It's suppressing data. If you take an average of something that's continually increasing, you're always going to get a lower number than your most recent number. Pooling should have the ability to go, pooling, smoothing should have the ability to go both ways based on just that the claims will fluctuate over time. But that's not the pattern we've seen here. And uh, what you just described, MVP's thinking on that, are we alone in that? In, are, in the rat, go in, ahead. In, in, in uh, what you just described, using the more, re I think, I, I won't say it exactly right, but uh, this isn't uh, uh, an averaging, it's simply showing an increase over time, and that's what we should be uh, basing our decision on. Is that correct? Correct. I think that there's, you know, actuarial professional discretion to look at this and say, you know, whether or not you've pooled in the past is every year is an independent decision. And looking at the data, MVP does not believe that 2021 is is an outlier to the to the extent that we think 2023 is going to go to the average of some historical number. We believe yeah. this is um, in effect a new norm in in where we'll operate. And what about Medicare and Medicaid? This, in general, this phenomenon of increase to large cost claims is something that MVP has been experiencing across all of its footprint. Okay, thank you. So the, the second it, point of dispute relates to uh, how l &E quantified their opinion. Uh, would you walk the board through uh, the, the issues there? Right? How many are there in your view? Sure, yep. I have three three general points on, on the math being used here that we we disagree on. And, and I would like to state up front that this, this is simply in the calculation of the adjustment in that um, we we want if an adjustment is to be made, we would we just want to ensure that the proper math be used to do it. And so the first disagreement is based on the averaging used. It LNE is taking a three-year arithmetic average of the prior three-year claims, but you can see in the table on page eleven that MVP's membership fluctuates over time. So a difference in membership, you would expect a difference in claims. That's um, you know that follows as a as an, a drastic example. If one year you have five members and the next year you have a hundred members, you wouldn't average the two total claims for those years and say that's what you would expect the future to be. It would be dependent on the the membership count that you expect to have or that you've had. And so, MVP believes that the averaging should be done as a three year average of the PMPMs, not a three year average of the total claims since that puts everything on a per member basis and can be adjusted for the membership in the projection period or the membership time period used. It does not 
allow for fluctuations in claims due to fluctuations in membership. And this, PM, PM, PM gets you to apples to apples. It's apples correct? to apples. Yep, it's apples to apples in the sense that it brings everything to the the amount of claims above the threshold on a member basis. So it doesn't matter if you have five members or a million members, it represents for a given member, that's the number. And so that should, we believe that's the average that should have been used. And what was the second issue? The second issue is the lack of trending of the adjustment. So LE is averaging 2019, 2020, and 2021, but medical trend exists every year. And What's the trend? that, what, yeah, what is trend, that? Medical trend is essentially the, the suite of services and things that you can get done at medical providers goes up every year. You know, that's seen through the hospital budgets and just generally is a major component of rate increases year over year is just trend. And so a claim that happened in 2019 would not cost the same in 2019 as it would in 2021 for the same exact thing to happen. Therefore, MVP believes that 2019 should be trended to a 2021 basis and 2020 should be trended to a 2021 basis in order to take that take that average because you're averaging three like things at that point. Now, that does introduce the possibility, and we'll see in later exhibits, that there could be a claim that was 109, there could be 10 claims that were 195,000 in 2019 that would have been over a 200,000 in 2021 based on medical trend, and that should be accounted for. That's a key component to making a normalized adjustment, which is what is attempting to be done here. And what's the third uh, quantification uh, clarification you'd like to make? Sure. So the third one is, is not actually impacting the adjustment, but it's a presentation, and based on our um, recommendation of the calculation of the adjustment, it, it will become important. So in the table on page 11, the members column does not represent MVP's average membership in that given year. It represents MVP's membership as of February of that given year, which does not take into account any membership changes that MVP would have had between February and December, which can fluctuate considerably due to the volatility of the small group you know, employer market and the individual market. So any changes that happened there would be reflected in claims, but are not reflected in that membership figure. MVP believes that column should show either total member months or total member months divided by 12 to give you average members in a given month. Further, the last column in that table, PMPM, is just the division of the large claims column and the members column, which is labeled as a PMPM, but is really a PMPY per member per year because the membership figure represents members at a given point in time. If, if the members column is updated to reflect member months, then that division can stay and those numbers would update appropriately. But the figures that are listed there are not PMPMs. It is not too, it, in 2021, it is not the claims were not $275.70 per member per month above 200,000. That would be per February members of 2021 per year, which is um, just mis just a misleading representation. And we um, we just propose that that math, you know, th that math gets altered if an adjustment gets pushed through. Right, and just so the record's clear, you said misleading. It's a mistaken. Right. I don't think LNE is trying to mislead anybody, correct? Correct. I guess my point is simply if you look at that, you could interpret it as $275 per member per month, but that is that is not the correct figure. It'd be confusing. Correct. Would you go to exhibit 41, please? Okay, so uh, as I understand it, you had two areas of dispute on this issue. One was uh, actuarial opinion, and two was on the math. Um, right. Would you please explain uh, what this document is, who prepared it, and what it shows? Sure. MVP prepared this document to essentially incorporate the the updated calculations that I just talked through and quantify what impact that would have on the rates. So in the first table for the individual market, 
we've incorporated the trending and we've also replaced the membership figure with member months and taken a member month average instead of uh, an arithmetic average. That results in a 0.62% decrease to rates as compared to the 0.7 LE had calculated. So it's a slight reduction to the decrease. The table on the right for the small group market includes the same the same changes, trending, member months, and the, the PMPM average, and results in a negative 0.56% increase or impact to rates as compared to the 0.9 LE um, calculated the first time. This one is a bigger increase because the 2019 column had several claims that were just under 200,000, which when accounting for trend, take it over 200,000, which increases that line item, which increases the average, which decreases the adjustment. So that is, MVP feels like that is actuarially sound math. That is the only actuarial sound you know, method you should use when doing an averaging like this. If you compare separate time periods, you, you need to trend them. So we believe that the adjustments on these, this page, the 0.62 and the 0.56, are the correct quantifications of the recommended changes um, proposed by l &E. So if you go with l &E's averaging route uh, and you make the three adjustments that you, you just testified to uh, on the individual market, it goes from 0.7 reduction to a 0.62 reduction, correct? That's correct, that's correct, yep. And same, if you do the same thing on the small group, their 0.9 reduction goes to a 0.56 reduction, correct? Correct. And I, I do want to note that in l and &E's, um, objections to MVP, excuse me, they did not, they only asked for claims at 200,000 or above. So the updates to this would require MVP to provide l and &E with data, you know, within 15,000, say, of 200,000 in prior years so that the trending could be done and the, the claims could be accounted for properly. MVP is happy to provide that data in post-hearing questions, you know, upon request. That's not an issue. Thanks very much. Okay, so those were the two issues in dispute. I'd like to talk about some other issues then with you. Um, if you would go back to Exhibit 12, please. and go to page four. I want to talk about the hospital budgets and medical trend. So go to page four of that exhibit. Okay. And you'll see down on the bottom is the discussion about trend starts. And then on the next page, uh, if you go to page five, you'll see a heading for medical unit cost trend. Do you see that? I do. And then down below that, at the bottom of the page, is medical utilization trend. Do you see that? I do. So those are the two components of medical trend, correct? That is correct. Okay, so going to the medical utilization trend, that goes on over to the next page, on page six. And it ends uh, with the first full paragraph. Are you with me? I am. Would you read the last sentence of the first full paragraph, please? l &E concludes that an annual utilization trend of 1.0% appears reasonable. Okay, so we have agreement with l &E on the 1%. That's reasonable, correct? That is correct. Okay. So let's talk about unit cost. That was the first item. Remember back to the bullets? This is that first item in the recommendations. Uh, to consider hospital budget information as it comes in, correct? That's correct. Since the this rate filing in May, and since this actuarial opinion, uh, Exhibit 12 of July the 5th, have the hospitals submitted the budget proposals to the Green Mountain Care Board? Yes. And have you reviewed those proposals? Yes. Would you go to Exhibit 34, please? And would you uh, identify the exhibit, please? Sure. This is MVP's response to 
an objection from l &E asking us to essentially quantify the impact of the proposed hospital budgets. And would you read the first two sentences uh, in the response under number one there, please? The average rate increase is 24.54 under the proposed hospital budgets on the GMCB website. This is higher than the 17.37 average rate increase that MEP previously proposed. Okay, so you, you testified uh, earlier, I just sort of asked you open-ended, what the, the impact for the hospitals is about 7%, and that, and that is uh, illustrated there, correct? And that's correct. Would you go to exhibit uh, 35, please? Let me know when you're there. I'm there. Would you identify the exhibit, please? This is our response to Eleni's objection asking us to quantify the hospital budgets, uh, the proposed hospital budget's impact on our small group filing. Okay. And same thing, would you read the first two sentences uh, in the response under number one? The average rate increase is 23.78 percent under the proposed hospital budgets on the GMCB website. This is higher than the 16.61 percent average rate increase that MVP previously proposed. Okay, so same answer, roughly 7 percent increased on, uh, because of the hospitals, correct? That's correct. Would you go to exhibit 39, please? Exhibit 39. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. First, just identify the document and uh, did MVP prepare it? Yep. The, yes, this is an MVP prepared table that is meant to just show the kind of before and after in both rate filings to from the initial proposal to the hospital budgets. Okay. So I want to ask you about the first three rows, just the first three rows right now. Would you please walk us through those first three rows uh, for the for the board and explain? Them? Yeah, the first row is the initial proposal. So that's what we proposed in early May. The second row is the updated figures with the proposed hospital budgets included. And the third row is the updated hospital budgets as well as um, updating the rate filings for the risk adjustment transfer uh, ad adjustment that was recommended by l &E and that we agree with. And that risk adjustment transfer was roughly about 0.1%, correct? In individual, for, yes. Well, and then small group was 0.3? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the timing uh, of the hospital uh, budget hearings in comparison to our hearing here today? I am. And they occur afterwards? That's correct. After the record is closed in this hearing, correct? Correct. Uh, and that could be a uh, well, I won't ask you what's in the, the board's mind, but uh, that's that's a challenge in your opinion. It it leaves uncertainty across the board. I think for both you know MVP when trying to project and and the board, it makes the job difficult. But at the end of the day, MVP just would like our rates to reflect the 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 hospital budgets that will be approved. Okay. So last year. What did the board do to address this uh, this this issue of timing? The board had l &E do a an analysis on historical budget cuts to the hospitals and um, based its approved rates of you know a decision on the MVP rate filings and uh, assumingly the other carrier as well to based on that you know uh, analysis done by Ani. And what did the board do in terms of in our uh, final decision? Uh, what did they do in terms of a cutting estimating the cut of the hospital budget? 
it was a 1% across the board reduction. And they directed MVP to do that uh, calculation pursuant to its order, correct? That's correct. Okay. Would you go to page four, excuse me, go to exhibit 42, please, 4-2. I would caution you, we're not going to talk about it, any of it, but there's some confidential stuff in this exhibit. Um, but if you would please go to exhibit 42, page three. And there's two tables on page three. Uh, would you read the heading of the second table? Average differences in approved and submitted hospital budget increases. And uh, this table reflects uh, LE's response to the board's request for some historical uh, budget cut uh, data analysis, correct? That is correct. In the far right corner, uh, that column is average four year difference, correct? Correct. And it's got various numbers for the hospitals, correct? That's correct. Now, at the bottom, there, there, there's no weighted average reflected at the bottom, correct? For all the hospitals? Correct. It would be different based for each carrier's utilization. Okay. And uh, were you able to do a, a calculation of that, what the weighted average would be? Yes. And what's that amount? 0.7%. Negative 0.7%, I should say. Thank you. So the weighted average on average uh, over the last four years, it's been a negative 0.7% weighted average, correct? Claim weighted, yes. Claim weighted. Thank you. Okay, would you go back, please, to Exhibit 39? Exhibit 39. And this is the uh, MVP updated rate increase summary table, correct? That's correct. And we've talked about the first three rows on this table already, correct? Correct. So I want to go to those last two rows. Um, what does row four reflect and what does row five reflect? Row four reflects the same calculation done in row two except all of the hospital, the proposed hospital budgets have been reduced by 1%. Row five reflects the same calculations as row three, except all of the proposed hospital budgets have been reduced by 1%. This is meant to give a point of reference to the board as to the impact of each percent on the 2023 hospital budgets. All right, so MVP is, as you sit here today, uh, it, and as I indicated in the opening, MVP is seeking uh, rate increases that are in the third row, correct? That is correct. 24.45 for individual and 23.44 for small group, correct? That is correct. Okay. And the last two rows are just a point of reference for the board, correct? That's correct. And row five includes the risk transfer reduction, correct? It does. That's that's correct. Thank you. Okay, I, I would ask you to go back to exhibit 12, please. Exhibit 12. And I want to ask you about pharmacy trend. Would you please go to page six? Okay. And you'll see a pharmacy trend heading in the middle of the page. And then pharmacy trend goes into uh, page seven as well. Um, if you would go to page seven then, and you'll see a table in the middle of the uh, exhibit on page seven, historical allowed Rx trends. Do you see that? I do. Would you please, uh, Describe to the board uh, concerns that MVP has uh, about specialty drugs. Yeah, so generally specialty drugs are a significant driver of pharmacy costs. They make up a very small percentage of the 
claims themselves, but a very substantial percentage of the cost. And as the FDA continues to approve and release these new um, these new specialty drugs to the market, it is expected to continue to have high utilization and high cost increases to pharmacy. Um, it it is it is expected to improve patient outcomes. So specialty drugs in a lot of cases are a wonder to the the you know members who need them. Um, but we did want to just point out that. In general, our pharmaceutical cost is driven mainly by the um, steady increase in utilization in cost, well, utilization in specialty drugs, as well as just the pure cost of the drugs themselves. Thank you. Let's turn now to contributions to reserves. Uh, first, what did uh, MVP propose this year for their CTR? 1.5%. And what is CTR? CTR stands for contribution to reserves, and it's it's essentially the amount of money that MVP is requesting to make sure that its reserves continue to keep pace with claims. So MVP has reserves that are set aside to pay the claims and ensure that each member, when they go to get care, that it's paid for, and it ensures MVP solvency. As claims continue to rise year over year with medical trend, MVP's reserves need to rise as well to ensure that we can keep um, keep paying claims effectively for the, our members. Thank you. And would you go please to Exhibit 12, uh, page 14, and let me know when you're there. Okay, I'm there. And you can see at the head, top heading changes in uh, contributions to reserves. So this is where L and E discusses CTR, correct? That's correct. And if you go to page fifteen, please. That discussion continues, and then the third paragraph. Starting with Eleni believes, if you could read that first sentence. Eleni believes the CTR assumptions are reasonable and appropriate as filed. So Eleni believes our CTR is reasonable and appropriate, correct? That's correct. Go back to page 14, please. And the third paragraph. And if you would, please read the sentences in that paragraph. Take your time. The proposed risk margin of 1.5% is consistent with the risk margin that was proposed in the 2022 filing, but an increase from the ordered 2022 risk margin of 0.5%. The 2023 projected federal loss ratio using this CTR is 91.9%, which exceeds the statutory minimum MLR of 80%. Would you explain to the board the significance of the comparison of the CTR for MVP and the MLR of 80%. Sure. The MVP projected federal loss ratio of 91.9% indicates that for every dollar of premium MVP takes in, we will pay out 91.9 .9 cents in claims. The statutory minimum is, is paying out 80 cents per dollar, which MVPs being significantly higher than that indicates that we are running lean as a company and we are not overcharging Vermonters for any other cost than what is needed to continue to run the business. Thank you. Would you go down um, to the fifth paragraph? It's the last paragraph under that table. Uh, let me know when you're there. I'm there. Would you read the paragraph which starts as a reasonableness check? Please read that paragraph. As a reasonableness check of the proposed CTR provision, l &E reviewed the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight public use files. In 2022, there were 442 carriers who submitted the individual or small group ACA filings nationally. The filed CTR varied from negative 17% to positive 9%, but most often fell between 0 and 5%. The mode is between 2 and 3%, and the premium weighted average CTR for all carriers was filed as 2.4%. MVP's filed CTR of 1.5% would place it around the 27th percentile for all QHP carriers. Thank you. 
So 442 car carriers, correct? Correct. And uh, the premium weighted average was 2.4%, correct? That's correct. And MVP's CTR of 1.5 falls at the 27th percentile, correct? That's correct. Which it's been a while uh, for me since uh, taking math and in, in uh, graded school, but that's that's on the lower end, correct? Correct. That indicates that 73% of filings would have a higher value than what MVP projected or proposed, asked for, I should say. Okay, so briefly, I wanted to uh, go through some wording with you, some words that l and &E uses here, just to clarify. Uh, would you go and you see that first table on page 14? I do. And it, and it shows uh, the CTR number, total CTR of 1.8. You see that? Yes. Uh, and you see the number above the 1.5%? Yes. So what is the CTR that MVP is seeking this year? The CTR that MVP is seeking is 1.5%. L&E here has risk margin labeled as 1.5%, but then below speaks to CTR as 1.5%. I think it's it's just a um, term of art difference. Okay, so if you go down, let's go back to that reasonableness check paragraph, the fifth paragraph, read the last sentence. MVP's filed CTR of 1.5% would place it at around the 20th, 27th percentile for all QHP carriers. Okay, so the 1.5 is the accurate figure, correct? That's correct. And the CTR figure that's of 1.5 proposed by MVP, that does not have a bad debt component, correct? That's correct. Okay, so... Um, on, I want to focus on page 14 on that second table. Um, what does this table show and could you explain these amounts over the years comparing actual to expected? Correct. Yes, this, this table shows actual to expected risk margin, otherwise known as profitability in the past three years. In 19, we were slightly below the ordered in 2020, we were slightly above. In 2021, we are significantly below. Now, it it goes to, it is worth noting that the expected CTR here is based on what initially MVP proposed and what the board cut to, if any. Any other cuts that were made to the rate filing and may have impacted MVP's um, determination of expected profitability are not included in that expected figure. Can I can I just to clarify that it's the first time uh, I got confused, Chris, throughout your, all your testimony, you're doing a great job, but there, um, those figures are what the board ordered for CTR in those years, correct? For CTR, correct. It's not what MVP asked for, it's what the board ordered, correct? That's correct. Okay. Go ahead, explain. Yeah, so I, I think it just, it shows that 2020 MVP was, did make money due to the suppression in COVID-19, or due to the, due to COVID-19 where we could not, um, a lot of physicians offices and certain services were shut down for a period of time. But we wanted to make note of this because there may be some notion that 21 is offsetting 2020 and carriers are, you know, starting over, it's all even, it, it's all good. but. MVP did lose significantly more money in 21 than it made in 2020, and that is of concern. And tell me about the loss in uh, 2021, please. Yes, it 11.1%, it 11, 11 which on a run rate basis is somewhere in the neighborhood of 23 million. Okay. And if MVP were to lose 11% in uh, 2020, 23 and the year after that and so on is that a sustainable uh, business model no it's unsustainable and would threaten solvency okay. i want to ask you next about rbc if you would well first of all what is rbc rbc stands for risk-based capital in in short it's a metric that is used to evaluate company solvency Okay, so let's go to page 15 of the exhibit. 
And there's a paragraph, the second paragraph, which is below that table. I want to ask you about that paragraph. Let me know when you're there. Okay, I'm there. Okay, this paragraph has five sentences. So I want you to read. Well, let me just ask you the first sentence you agree with, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, would you read the second and third sentences, please? Vermont business accounts for approximately 5% of MVP's overall business. Therefore, L&E believes it is not a significant factor in determining company RBC ratio. And what are your thoughts about those, those statements? While MVP does agree that, um, as Jay stated earlier, that MVP's business accounts for approximately 5% of overall business or seven between five and seven and a half, depending on the metrics that you use, we definitely disagree that it is not a significant factor in determining the RBC ratio. While it being a small percent of the business may mean that it's a small portion of the denominator of the RBC, the numerator of the RBC is total capital. And in 2021, MVP Health Plan in total lost on our financial statements lost about $32 million. 30 million of that came from the Vermont small and individual markets. That's about 96% indicating that is the main driver. That was a large driver of the decrease in RBC was the fact that we lost $32 million and that reduced our capital. So the notion that Vermont is so small, it can't impact MVP is false because we, we lost 96% of our money in Vermont last year. And that was the direct contributor to the lower RBC ratio, which we want to point out, you know, th that it is, it can and will have an impact due to the magnitude of the Vermont losses. Okay. Um and did you hear Jane is opening? And I may not quote it exactly, but I wrote it down. He said something to the effect of uh, Ver Vermont should not be subsidizing bad results in New York. Did you hear that? Yes. Vermonters shouldn't be. Right. Uh, and uh, do you agree with that? I agree. And and I I believe that, you know, we state this um, every year, but Vermont is rated as its own block of business. New York is rated as its own block of business. Even within Vermont now, small group and individual are rated as their own blocks of business. And what happens in one has no impact on the other. The data is independent and it's all rated separately. So, uh a bad year in Vermont, New Yorkers shouldn't have to pay for that and vice versa, correct? That's correct. Would you please uh, read the fourth sentence in the paragraph? l &E notes that it is not sustainable to have long-term negative profits and therefore a higher CTR could be justified. Agree with that? I do agree. It is not sustainable. And then read the last sentence, please. Given this information, Eleni believes that a CTR between 0.5% and 3% would be considered reasonable. So why didn't MVP this year say 2% or 2.5% or 3% for their CTR request? Because MVP's rates this year that we're proposing for 2023 are not designed to make up any losses that we had in 2021. They're simply designed to get our premiums to a, a level where we can continue to be solvent at a stable level. And the 1.5 is what we feel is the appropriate increase to reserves to get us there. We have no intention or desire to charge Vermonters any more money than we have to to cover their um, health care. And that by that we think 1.5 percent is appropriate and any more would be trying to recoup prior losses which is not um actually appropriate thank you would you please go to exhibit 14. and identify the exhibit please 
This exhibit is the DFR um, solvency impact memo that they um, send for the individual market every year. Okay, and exhibit 15 is the uh, same letter, but for the small group filing, is that right? That's correct. And you've reviewed them and are familiar with them? Yes. And the substance of the two letters are the same, except one is for the individual and one is for the small group? That's correct. So let's go to exhibit 14 and please read under summary of opinion the sentence. The proposed rate filed by MVPHP would not negatively impact its solvency and the company otherwise meets Vermont financial licensing requirements for a foreign insurer. And you would agree with that? I would. And you would agree with that under the new proposed rate, that third row in, in the exhibit we talked about? Correct. Okay, second page of the exhibit, the third bullet. Would you please uh, read it? Finally, in, all, in 2021, all of MVP holding companies' operations in Vermont accounted for approximately 7.5% of its total premiums written. DFR has determined that MVPHP's Vermont operations pose little risk to its solvency. Nonetheless, adequacy of rates and contributions to surplus are necessary for all health insurers to maintain strength of capital that keeps pace with claim trends. Um, you discussed earlier, uh, you took issue with l &E describing, uh, and uh, Jay talked about it in his opening, MVP being a small, tiny bit of the business overall, so it really doesn't matter what happens in Vermont. That's not exactly what he said, but you know what I'm getting at, correct? That's correct. Uh, so uh, when DFR references, well, first, the percent of business, uh, we've heard 5% and 7.5% without getting into great detail. It's somewhere in that range. Is that correct? Yes, I, I I assume that these are two different sources, maybe at two different time periods, and result in slightly different numbers. But you know, it 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 tells the scale of it. Yes. And for for what you described earlier, you would uh, disagree uh, with the notion that the smaller business in Vermont uh, doesn't have an impact, correct? I I yes, I disagree with that for the same reasons as stated before that. In 2021, Vermont accounted for 96% of MVP health plans um, losses, which include um, a lot of New York business. So it's not, it's, I don't want to make it, I want to make it clear that Vermont's not the only thing on MVP health plan. There is a lot of New York business and Vermont accounted for 96% of the losses. And then under impact of the filing on solvency, would you read the last sentence, please? Based on the entity-wide assessment above and contingent upon the GMCB actuaries filing that the proposed rate is not inadequate, DFR's opinion is that the proposed rate will not have a negative impact on MVP HP solvency. And would you agree with that with the proposed rate, as you sit here today, of individuals 24.45 and small groups of 23.44? Yes. Okay. So, um, Go to exhibit 39, please. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. So again, it's this third row on exhibit 39. That's what we're seeking here, correct? At the moment, yes. And those rates are not inadequate in your opinion, correct? That is correct. Next, I want to ask you about uh, some non-actuarial issues. If you would please go to your pre file testimony, Exhibit 16. 16, please. And then I would direct you to page 6, question 19. Okay. Would you please uh, read the question and then just tell the board what, what this sets out? Jim. 
What steps has MVP taken to lower costs and establish that its proposed rates promote affordability, access to care, and quality of care for Vermonters? This, this question lays out the groundwork for the remaining questions or a subset of the remaining questions in the pre-filed testimony of which MVP talks about the, the steps that we, we have taken or plan to take to um, do all of the you know, parts of the statute, affordability, access to care, and quality of care. Okay, thank you. And so the, there's 15 items listed there, I believe, correct? That's correct. And then if we drill down deeper and provide more information about one of the items, it's referenced, uh, it's referenced there next to the item, correct? That's correct. And uh, with these items, your pre-filed testimony here, uh, your testimony today, all the other filings uh, in the case and evidence, uh, evidence some of the steps that MVPs take to lower costs, promote quality of care and access, and establish that the rates proposed are affordable for Vermonters. That's correct. In your opinion, Will short-term underpricing make insurance affordable in the long run? No. Why not? Because each year is priced on its own, and the, the fact that underpricing happens will just be accounted for in the next, the next year's rates in the sense that every year MVP is projecting rates to the year of the rate. So this year we're projecting to 23. If if the claim cost can in in the future, we're going to continue to do that, and the premiums will be what they are. Last year's premiums don't impact the prior the the following year rates. So underpricing is is not going to make healthcare affordable, or not make long term affordability. Okay. Thank you. Let's go through the statutory criteria then, please. Um, MVP's proposed rates as modified by your testimony and other evidence for individuals of 24.45 and small group of 23.44 includes the hospital budget increases proposed if approved by the board and the risk adjustment, the risk adjustment of the 0.1%. Uh, is it your opinion that, that those rates are actuarially sound and reasonable? That's correct. Do the MVP rates meet the standard of affordability based on the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? Yes, the rates are affordable because they align the healthcare costs and the benefits provided at the minimum costs we've been able to achieve. Do the rates promote quality of care and access to healthcare based on the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? Yes. Is the rate filing unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to law based on the rate filing, other evidence, and your testimony today? No. Are the rates reasonable based on the data that we have? Yes. Are the rates actually really sound and fairly charged premium for services covered? Yes. Are the rates excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory? No. Are the rates reasonable relative to the benefits that are offered? Yes. Do they provide for payment of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, regulatory fees, and have reasonable contingency or profit margins? Yes. So they are adequate? Yes. Do the rates exceed the rate needed to provide for payment of claims, administrative expenses, taxes, regulatory fees, and reasonable contingency uh, for profit margin. Correct. Uh, well, are the rates excessive? No. So when I asked you if the rates exceed, you said correct. Do um, you want to think about that response? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I was. Um, the, can you reread the question? Sure. There's all these double negatives. It's my fault. Yeah. So let me re ask you the question. Uh, do the rates exceed exceed the rate needed to provide for payment of claims, administrative ex expenses, taxes, regulatory fees, and a reasonable contingency or profit margin? No. Do the rates result in premium differences among insureds within similar risk categories, which are not permissible under applicable law and do not 
reasonably correspond to differences in expected costs? No. So they're not unfairly discriminatory. That's correct. Would you agree with me that the statutory criteria we just went through are interrelated? Yes. They're not siloed. That's correct. Any adjustments to a rate increase for whatever reason all feed into the final number, correct? Correct. It's important that the final number is actuarially sound and reasonable. That's correct. In this case, the 24.45 for individual and the 23.44 for small group, uh, are they actually sound and reasonable? They are. And in your opinion, do those rates meet the statutory criteria? They do. And if the board cuts the final number on non-actuarial grounds, is there a risk that the rate would no longer be adequate? Yes. Thank you very much, Chris. That's all the questions I have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Carnegie, Mr. Pontiff. Uh, I think at this point, we could all benefit from a short break, uh, and I think we're doing well on time. So why don't we reconvene this hearing at 10 after 10? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're back on record in the matter of MVP Healthcare's 2023 individual and small group rate filings. We just finished the direct testimony of Christopher Pontiff, uh, and now we'll move to cross. So, Mr. Angoff, you have questions for Mr. Pontiff. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Good morning, Mr. Pontiff. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm good. How are you? Good. Could you please turn to Exhibit 11? and just go to the last page there, the chart, which is the last page of that uh, June 27th letter. Okay. Okay, and what I'd like to do is to make sure that I understand and the board understands how much more people would be paying this year under the MVP proposed increases. Uh, on the second chart, on. The, that is the chart on the right, the right hand side of the page. Uh, can you go down to the line where it lists the data for 300% of federal poverty? You see that? I do. Okay. And for and, and so what what this shows, what what that line shows, doesn't it, is the additional amount that people would be paying today for. MVP's lowest cost bronze, silver, and gold plans under MVP's proposed increase. Is that right? Yes, with the assumption that the the American Rescue Plan Act is not um, restored in any fashion. Yes. Okay, and is that the how much they would be paid paying in accordance with your initially proposed increase, or does that take account of the additional amount that you've asked for based on uh, what you believe the hospital, uh, the, the hospital uh, budgets will show. That this, this table is based on the initially proposed increases. Okay, and so how much more would people be paying than the amounts shown here? Let's start with people at 300% of poverty. Yes, yeah, so I don't, those numbers are hard to calculate because it's based on the second lowest cost silver plan in the region and or the region which for Vermont is just the state. And given Blue Cross will have an impact of the hospitals as we will have an impact, it's very hard to know how much that lowest second loss, lowest cost silver plan will be impacted to calculate the subsidies. So without a final decision, that's not a calculatable number at this point. Okay, well, can you give us a range or you just have no idea? It's it's going to be more. It would be more. That would be for sure. It depends on, like I said, the relationship between our increase and Blue Cross's increase. Okay. And does the does it depend? Does does the additional amount more depend on the person's income level too? 
meaning will it fluctuate by income level? Yes, the, the, the problem that you, that, that you just described about the second highest or second lowest priced silver plan, does that affect the prices that everyone would pay regardless of uh, what their income is or does it only affect people at a certain income level? It only affects people below the, the threshold, um, the maximum. Well, I believe with without ARPA, um, it, it would be 400%, I believe, is where the APTC stopped being available. So anybody below that, it would impact. Anybody above it would see the full increase to the premium. Okay. And so let's take somebody at 500% of F federal poverty. So under your original increase for a bronze plan, they'd be paying $383 more than they're already paying, correct? That's okay. correct. And then, okay, and then would they be paying an additional amount more based on the additional amount that you've asked for? Yes. Okay, and are, are you saying you can't calculate that, that you have no idea what that is? For, for those people in this table above 400%, the increase would be the increase to that plan they would feel the they would feel the full effects of the increase because they are not receiving any subsidies under this plan okay so what increment would that can you give me an example what would the what what would the increment be how much yep. more would it be? so around seven percent if if a premium is five hundred dollars that's you know thirty five dollars um Okay, so 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 the increase, the, the percentage is figured on the original premium, not on the not on the amount of the increase, right? For anybody above anybody above four hundred percent who will no longer qualify for subsidies, that is correct. Right. They are paying okay. the full price. Okay, so so say somebody uh, paying about four hundred bucks more under your original increase, and let's assume the the. Uh, He's currently paying five hundred bucks. He'd pay uh, he'd pay another seven seven percent of that five hundred. Correct. Correct. Okay. And let me just make sure I understand what the uh, what some of the characteristics are of your uh, lowest cost metal level plans. What is the deductible for the for your lowest cost bronze plan? I do not know that offhand. That is an exhibit in our rate filing. I can turn to and give you that answer if you would like, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, why don't you turn to it and uh, okay. give me the answer. I believe it to be $5,800. That's, that's the deductible for your lowest price bronze plan for an individual? Yes. Yes, I, yes. Okay, and you have in front of you, I don't want to take too much time with this, but do you have the same data for your silver and gold plans? Yes. Okay. The, or no, sorry, sorry, I misspoke, Jay. That would have been the highest cost bronze plan. The lowest cost bronze plan would be 9100 Okay, and and the data that you have in this uh, chart are for your lowest cost metal level plans, right? Correct. Okay, and so what would the dedu <clears throat> the deductible for your lowest cost bronze plan is ninety one hundred. What's the deductible for your lowest cost silver plan? Ninety one hundred. I believe it to be fifty five hundred. Okay, and then finally for your lowest cost gold plan, what's the deductible for that? 3,200, I believe. Okay, and do you all uh, not sell platinum plans? We sell one platinum plan, just the standard platinum plan. Okay, and is there a reason why data for the platinum plan isn't here? There, 
Not outside of the fact that the platinum plans are not usually selected by members who are getting premium subsidies. There is a lower, a much lower selection rate in platinum because it's a leveraged impact because it's it's based on the silver plan. So they don't get as good of a deal per se on the platinum plans. They still have a high out-of-pocket um, premium cost. Okay. And they would still pay more like this year, like everybody else, right? Correct. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change the relationship. No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'd just like to ask you a couple of questions about the rest of this document, which is your responses to uh, Trace, a couple of Tracy Hughes's questions. Could you turn please to page two and look down at the bottom of question eight? Okay. Okay, you see question eight asks for, doesn't it, among other things, the actual amounts that MVP received related to cost sharing, reduction litigation, and risk card litigation. Do you see that? I do. Okay. And Mr. Pontiff, I mean, I mean this in the nicest possible way, but why didn't you answer the question? So for this question, we did uh, reach out to our legal team and ask them, and their feedback was they, they cannot speculate on the amount to be recovered because it is unknown at this time. Right. But that's not the question that I just asked, and that's not the question that's, that is part of this question. This question asked, in addition for your expected recoveries, what were your actual recoveries? related to cost sharing, reduction litigation, and risk harder litigation. And you did not answer that, correct? I, be I believe that, and I, I, will, I can follow up with our legal team, but I believe that we have not received any monies to this point, and that's why it was a speculation as to what would be recovered. Oh, interesting. Okay, so, so you, your your testimony is that MVP has never received any monies related to cost sharing reduction litigation or risk card litigation. Is that right? I can't I can't say that for sure. I'm not in the legal department. I I would have to follow up with them. Our feedback their feedback to me was they cannot speculate on the amount to be recovered. And the, and the reason they say they can't speculate as to the amount to be recovered is what because it's not known at this time. It would it would be pure speculation and it's I believe it's a nation it's a national situation and there's going to be some allocation if monies are given and it was not something that we're privy to the the value of yet. Okay, and have you have you followed the progress of either of those pieces of litigation yourself? Myself not closely, no. Okay. You follow them a little bit? Not other than when it's brought up for us to confer with the legal team. That's that's something our legal team handles. Okay. Um, by the way, you, you said you're the head of, of commercial pricing for MVP. Is that for the whole company, both Vermont and New York? That's correct. Okay. Um, and at the beginning of your testimony, you said you did 10 filings. Were those Vermont filings or were those both Vermont and New York filings? That's 10 for the state of Vermont. Five, I worked on five, five years of filings in both the, the exchange world, which is where we're now, and large group. Okay, and without giving the, the names of each filing, can you just tell me what, what type of business those filings involve? Yeah, the small and individual rates for the past five years for Vermont and the large group um, rates, so for large employers. Okay. And do the large group rates include a 1.5% CTR provision, do you know? I believe we in the past have filed a 2% a CTR provision. Do you know that? That is my recollection. And is that insured business or ASO business? That's fully insured business. Okay. Can you turn to page three of Exhibit 11? Okay, and go down there to uh, question 10, please, which concerns the 1.5 contribution to reserves. Okay. 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 There is no statute, is there, that you're aware of that requires 
either either a Vermont statute or a New York statute that requires a certain uh, percentage increase on any given block of business, correct? To my knowledge, there is no statute that is, um, yes, that says you must increase anything by anything. The, the, it is more designed around protecting, generally protecting solvency, of which that is a method to do so. Sure, but surplus is fungible, though, right? MVP doesn't have a certain amount of surplus earmarked for New York business and a certain amount earmarked for Vermont business, right? I'm unfamiliar with the allocation of our total surplus and how it flows into the financial statements. Oh, is that right? Who would be familiar with that? Our, our accounting department. Uh, could you look at the table on the bottom of page three? And there it has, it shows your investment returns, your, your investment income for the last couple of years. You see that? That's correct. Okay. And is the fluctuation in those, uh, those numbers simply due to the, uh, the performance of the financial markets? No, this, the investment income you see here is simply, is, is essentially all um, realized gains from fixed income investments. Anything from the financial markets is not reported on a statutory basis until it is realized. On a gap basis, it is. So nothing reflected here shows any impact of MVP's unrealized um, losses in 2021 or 2022 either way for the financial markets. Okay, and, and this is, is this investment income for the company as a whole? This is for MVP Health Plan, the, the subsidiary. Okay, so, sorry, so, so does it cover both Vermont and New York business? It covers all of Vermont and most of New York. There is some New York that lives under MVP um, Health Service Corp, which is another subsidiary that is is different. Okay, and can you explain? Uh, can you explain exactly how MVP factors investment income into its uh, rate base? Yes, investment income is a component of our derivation of contribution to reserves. So it is it is part of the equation that we. Um, you know, discuss and determine what we're going to um, propose for a contribution to reserves, because at the end of the day, investment income is a is an increase to reserves, is an increase to free capital, um, and if if necessary, MVP will take that into account to either request more or less contribution to surplus based on the performance. Is there a line item? in your rate filing where you either uh, show an increased cost or a reduced cost based on your investment income? No, it is part of the derivation of the uh, contribution to reserve. Okay, and are you familiar with ASOP 26? I am. Okay, and is it your position that what MVP does in connection, the, the consideration that MVP gives to its investment income is consistent with ASOP 26? Correct. I believe ASOP 26 says that investment income should be taken into account when rating. MVP does that by factoring it into, it is fact, investment income is taken into account in the total premiums MVP offers or proposes to its Vermont members and New York members. And so in that sense, yes, it is taken into account. It is not a direct line item because as an actuary, it's our job to project future costs and align premiums with those costs and adjusting for investment income explicitly as a claim item would be inappropriate. Do you know whether do you know whether there are any companies that do include investment income as a line item in the rate base? I do not know. You don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah. I don't review um, it, it's not part of my job to review several other companies rate funds. Very good. Could you turn to the next page uh, question 12 there? Yes. Okay, and th that, that's a bad question, and you gave exactly the right answer. I'm just going to ask you to follow up on that answer. 
the, the question is, does MVP calculate a return on investment for its utilization management program? And you answered exactly the question that was asked. Your answer was yes. But now I'm just asking you, can you disclose what that return on investment has been? Yeah, so I, I can't give exact numbers because as I as I stated, return on investment on utilization managed pro programs is one of the more difficult things in healthcare economics to to achieve because there is an implicit assumption that you have to make on what would have happened given the program didn't exist. For example, if you have a program that's supposed to manage diabetes and diabetes costs go down in the next year, well, you don't know how much of that is a decrease because the members just handled it better themselves or how much was your program. So how much of the savings do you allocate to the institution of that program is a very difficult um, task to undertake. And so MVP does have several utilization management programs and we do attempt to calculate the savings of which I don't have the exact numbers that lives within the clinical department, but any explicit savings that are projected or anything that has materialized is implicit in the rate filing. So can you give us, can you at least give us a range for the answer to that question? I, I don't I I don't know the exact numbers. It's it's factored into two components. One, it could be factored into the um, it's it's in the claims if it's a historical program that is reducing 2021 cost. It it could also be in our um, derivation or decision on utilization trends and or um, other trends at other facilities if we think that one of our programs is going to reduce cost materially or if it's something outside of that it could be a unique line item. So it could be any number of places with any number of values, and I don't have an exact number for you. Okay. Could you turn, play, please, Mr. Pontiff, to Exhibit 4? Yes. Okay, and could you go to page 3? And uh, I have a few questions about question 2. Okay. Okay, you see in your... In your first, uh, the first sentence of your response, you say that MVP used the triple exponential smoothing forecasting method. You see that? Yes. Oh, so, so, like most people, I've always been fascinated by the triple exponential smoothing forecasting method. But what I'd like to ask you is, um, the, in the last sentence of that paragraph, you say that MVP has determined that the range of utilization trends forecasted by the model is too large to have confidence in the result. And I'd like to ask you, what was that range? And why was it too large to have confidence in the result? Yes, it's a good question. Can I believe that that data is in the attachments to this exhibit? And maybe we can go there to page, um, let me see. page 20 in here, it, you can see there's a, a table that says two-year trends. And there's the, from the fifth to the 95th percentile. And the, the values, the values in the, the first row of that, where you see the percentages are the annualized values. And so we, you can see that the fifth percentile is negative 5%, the 95th percentile is 12%. Part of doing forecasting and projections of data is, is not always what is it give as a best estimate, but what is the range around that best estimate? There's a thing called standard error, and the bigger that gets, the model can any model can give anybody a best estimate. But if the model doesn't feel that the bounds around that are tight, then that model is not very predictive. And that's what we got here because you the the range is essentially. 18%. So we felt that picking any number, if we use the 50th percentile, say of 3.4% utilization trend, just was was no better than using a more industry or historical um, provided value because it the data just did not seem credible. And we 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 attribute that to the decrease of services in 2020 and then the ramp back up in 2021, which is 
just confusing the model. So it's something that's likely to persist for some period of time until 2020 data can get out of the, the equation. But it's it's difficult. It's also difficult to smooth that and level it out. That's what the model attempts to do, but still results in an 18% range. That's a, I think I understood that explanation. I think it's a good explanation, but I don't know what document you were talking from. Can you point me to it? Yes, sorry. Um, page 20 in Exhibit 4. I, I don't know, and maybe somebody on the Greenmount Care Board team or Gary can help me out here. This may have been the things that were added last night. Oh, okay, that explains it then. Yeah, I couldn't find it. Exactly right. Okay. Sorry. So, so the, what you were, where you were just talking from was based on a document that was added last night. It's it's a do, it's it's an attachment that was initially provided with the objection, but I think the the Excel files or PDFs in the attachment were not or in the objection were not added until last night. That's fine, and I'm not going to prolong this. Um, let me try to shortcut it. So, how, how do you determine? the the bounds of a reasonable range that's also a good question and th and that's a difficult um it's a it's a difficult question for me to give you a firm answer to i think it's based on it's based on um just professional judgment as you look at it and determine if if you feel like if you feel like if five percent like in the fifth percentile would we say that five out of 100 years, we would expect a negative 6% trend. The answer to us for that was no. So that's kind of how we tried to gauge it. And same thing on the positive end. So if, if we had a range where we would say, maybe in five out of 100 years, we would expect a, a negative 2% trend or a positive 3% trend, that may be a range that we say, okay, that's justifiable, we use that. So it's it's not it's not prescribed. Okay, so it's it's big. Is it fair to say then actuaries determine a reasonable range based on their actuarial judgment? Yes, I think that's fair. Okay, and is there any ASOP that limits that actuarial judgment in any way? There's there's a few ASOPs regarding data and data quality, um, and that is part of what you're supposed to take into account. And I think this is a data, I, I wouldn't say it's a data quality issue necessarily, but it's a data quality concern and point of, um, I think using this data would be more in breach of ASOP 23, given you know that there's confounding factors. Okay, and is there any society of actuary guidance which, uh, which prescribes or limits the uh, actuary's professional judgment in determining a reasonable range? Not not that I know of, as long as there's proper justification. I think justification is the big, big item. Okay, and you can give me an example of what would constitute proper, ju just an example or two of what would constitute proper justification. Yeah, I think backed by data, data and um, just uh, maybe context, which I, I think is, I think what I just took you through in terms of that that exhibit and why we decided not to use the range is what I would consider appropriate. Um, justification for not using that that data. I get that. Okay. Are, are there any assumptions in the in your rate filing that you've made that you think are the only actuarial actuarial sound assumptions a reasonable actuary could come to? In terms of picking point estimates, no. Could you uh Turn, please, to oh, page on Exhibit 4, page 5. Uh, at the bottom of the page, you're discussing MVP's growth from 17% to 50% 50, to 50 of the market there. Age five. Yes. Okay. That's correct. So, were you the head of commercial pricing during this, uh, during that entire period? No. Okay. Were you with MVP during that entire period? I joined MVP in 2017. Okay. Well, do, do you know how MVP came to grow so much and so fast? My 
my understanding of that is lower premiums. Okay, and do you know whether MVP ever did any retention analysis when it was uh, putting together its rate filings? This year or in the past years? Over, since, since you've been involved with the Vermont individual and small group filings. Yes, we, we have looked at retention. Okay, and what, have you, what did you fa find based on your retention analysis? It was actually quite surprising that there is a lot of churn in both the individual and small group markets where I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna throw out um, some numbers of, let's say we have 20,000 small group members any given month. I think over the course of 2019 or 2020, we may have had 30, 35,000 unique small group members. So there is a, a lot, well, the number per month doesn't seem to fluctuate, there is a lot of in and out, you know, and, and it makes sense in a small group, you know, small group employers are small, people come, they go on jobs and things of that nature. So that drives it. If you're talking groups specifically, if groups in the small group market are leaving us or staying with us, that's not something. It was it was more looking at mem membership over time. And did you look at the morbidity of the membership and in particular the morbidity of the additional membership that you gained each year? To the extent that we can quantify that, yes. And but I'll just leave it there. I assume you have a follow up to that. Uh, I'm sorry. I no. I said I'll leave it there. I assume you have a follow up. I don't want to answer your next question before you ask it. Actually, I didn't have a follow up. I guess I should have. Uh, <laughs> if that's your answer, I'll take that. Uh, can you go please to page still in Exhibit Four, Six Seven? Page eight. Okay. Okay, and there's a lot of discussion there in the middle of the page about uh, your assumptions relating to COVID, right? That's correct. Okay, and I, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. First, in your discussion on line uh, of line 13, in your last sentence, you say that the assumption of 30 percent was derived from conversations with medical doctors and emerging claims. And I'd just like you to describe for, for me and for the board what, what the, to the best that you can, what those conversations consisted of and how you came to arrive at that 30% figure. Sure. So what we attempted to do before our, before our conversations with the medical doctors was pull in the data and and understand what the COVID services claim data looked like, you know, month by month from January of 2020, which you know nothing basically, to to the most recent data we had, which would have been February of 2022. Then we sat down with the medical doctors. We put that in front of them and said, "Here's what MVP is currently experiencing," and and had them talk us through the 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 science of it. Right? Like I, I'm not a medical professional. I don't understand the way viruses work, the way they transmit, the way they mutate over time, and if it becomes more or less infectious, more or less um, morbid, I, I don't know. We, as an actual team, are not charged with knowing that. So right. we that's had discussions, right? Correct, that that's correct. So we had discussions around their, their understanding of and beliefs on where COVID will go in the, in the coming years and our claims data that we've already seen. So we tried to blend the, the physician side of the medicine and the data side of reality and blended that together to get in a, an assumption of 30% reduction. Okay, and so, so did you make an actuarial judgment or is, or is, or is the 30% uh, assumption a, a non-actuarial assumption? I would say this is actually at the end of the day, I had to make a decision and it's my, you know, it's my name on the filing, my name on the memorandum. This is a decision that I made and we, it was in conjunction with them. That was their, that was part of their feedback. And I ultimately could have picked a different assumption if I felt it was more appropriate. So as an actuary, you can rely on, uh, on, a data which you reasonably believe to be accurate. Yes, right. and you should. Okay. Um, there was some discussion which I tried to follow, but I didn't 
totally follow it. I think you will, you're explaining it, so I think you can explain it better than I, I can articulate it. But my basic question is, are you sure that the amount that you are assuming that the, uh, the, the vaccine will cost is something that MVP will pay for rather than the government? Can you restate that question? I want to make yeah. sure I answer it properly. It, it, it's a bad question. You, you say, um, let's look at line 14. You, you say that uh, your projection is based on 52% utilization, 1.4 shots per member, and uh, a, a is that a dollar four per, sh per shot or 104 bucks per shot? 100, 104. Okay. And so, yeah, so, so my question is, are you sure that MVP will be paying that 104 rather than the government or some combination of the government and some other entity. I cannot say with 100% certainty, but it is my it is my job to make the best estimates of the cost and we are very confident that MVP will be picking it up, but I don't want to sit here and say 100% and then it not happen. Okay, but so that, that's what you were talking about when you said you had an expectation that uh, based on something the government had already done, that, yep. that the carriers would be picking it up, right? That's correct. Okay, and uh, you talk about 52% utilization and you agree that that 52% that is based on a Medicare population, right? I, I don't know that for sure. I don't know the data set, but I would assume so, yes. I mean, it's CMS data. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. Yep. And, you also, and you also agree that Medicare people, people who are 65 or older, older, they're very, they're more concerned with young people like you. They're more concerned than you would be about getting all their shots. Correct. On average, I w I would say that's appropriate. Okay, but you think because Vermonters are are, are better at this, Vermonters are have a better vaccination rate, it's sort of a wash and it makes sense then to use the, the 52% that is in the CMS data. Correct, we, we believe that that was the most appropriate estimation based on the fact that I, I believe Vermont is number one in the country in terms of vaccination rates. So I don't anticipate um, there, if 95% of people are willing to get the vaccine, I don't think that they're gonna just quickly drop off. I agree with you about Vermont. And I did have a follow-up question about the growth in MVP's business. And the, the follow-up question is this. It's correct, isn't it, that as MVP expands its business, it needs more surplus to support that business, right? That's generally correct, yes. And it, if we, yes. Okay. And therefore, all else equal, as MVP expands its business, if nothing else changes, MVP's RBC ratio would go down, right? Yes. Okay. All then, else equal, yes. Right. Okay. And then conversely, if maybe it's not conversely, but, but another effect of MVP expanding its business is, isn't it, that its administrative costs can be spread over a larger base, and therefore the administrative cost per member would go down, right? To the extent that there are fixed costs, yes. To the extent that we have variable costs, no. Okay, could you turn then, and this is the last group of questions I've got on this, uh, this exhibit, to uh, the second to last page where you list the, the admin costs uh, each year since 2016? Yes. Okay, so you, you've you said correctly, or I've got no, no reason to doubt it, that MVP has expanded its business from 17% of the market to 50% 50, 50 of the market since 2017, but the individual admin costs have gone up from $38.54 to $51.71 during that time. To me, that doesn't make sense. Could you explain why that is? 
Sure, I think there's a couple things at play here. The 2021 numbers are significantly higher than the numbers in previous years. And and I believe we talked the board through that last year, and that was uh, ultimately approved in our in our rates due to um, additional investments MVP has been making in the state of Vermont. And that was that was the reason for that. Now, prior to that, I would say that there wasn't much movement from 2017 to 18, 19, or 20. And you know, other factors such as when you're only a small percent of the market, there's less um, there's less things that you have to do that cost money in that market. So as MVP ramped up membership, it had to continue making investments, which cost money. Also, you would naturally expect there to be some offsetting impact of in in you know. Uh, salary increases and just general cost inflation over time, not speaking specifically to the cost inflation we're undergoing now, but just annual um, inflation of costs on a normal normal year. Okay, and so you, you mentioned investments that MVP had made in Vermont. What were those investments? Yeah, I, I believe that I, I, some of this is confidential, but I'll, I'll just say in general that we've made investments to enhance member experience and also a lot of investments around the UVM partnership, which I can't go into more detail than that um, here. Okay, and I won't ask you more detail about that, except that I will ask you, are all those investments focused solely on the individual and small group business? They are not, and nor are the costs. The costs are allocated out appropriately. Okay, so so what so what other in what other types of business do those investments uh, benefit? It benefits the um, Medicare Advantage population in, in Vermont, which is the current focus or, or the current um, you know we have a currently we have a co-branded product with UVM um, as part of our partnership for Medicare Advantage, as well as Large Group. Now, Large Group is a is a much smaller market than small individual. We have about 2,000 members, so it, it's not um, it's not the, as big of a population. But the costs are spread out by membership. Okay. And do you have any idea of how of what percentage is allocated to the uh, individual and small group business, and what percentage to other businesses? I don't. That would be something that came from our financial planning and analysis team. Okay, could you turn to your rate filing to exhibit one, page 142. One forty nine. Okay. Um, just and on the very last page there, there's a reference to a surcharge levied by the state of Massachusetts. Could you explain what that is and explain why Vermont should be paying for it? Yeah. So this surcharge is essentially when a Vermonter uses a Massachusetts facility, there's a surcharge levied on that claim, and it is we are not, we are only adding the value at which the Vermonters have used Massachusetts facilities. This is not, it's the same thing for New Yorkers going to Vermont or going to Massachusetts facilities. And it's similar to if a Vermonter goes to a New York facility, there's something called HICRA that is added to it, which is a very similar type of surcharge. It's just like a little tax that um, the state charges on using the facilities in that area. Okay. Um, could you go to the last page of that uh, exhibit one, which is page 154, under your actuarial certification description? Okay. Okay, you see the second to last paragraph, you say that the, that the, uh, the proposed premiums may not be reasonable if uh, there are changes to the enforcement of the individual mandate or changes to the rules around selling across state lines or association groups. You see that? Yes. Okay, so if such changes are made, the rates would be inadequate, right? I, or they could be excessive. I, it, okay. I don't know, it depends, what, it depends what regulation is changed and what it does. 
if if they pass something that reduced healthcare costs by 50% tomorrow, our rates would be excessive. That would be correct. So, for example, if Congress did more than talk about reducing prescription drug costs and actually pass legislation that would do it, that would that would have uh, that would reduce your rates. Correct. We we if they did that, we would be more than happy to pass any reduction through. Okay. Um, could you turn, please, to Exhibit 17, and I just have one question that I want to ask on the second page. Okay. Okay, so on the bottom of the second page there, you, you uh, describe, uh, I'm sorry, the questioner describes various cost containment initiatives, right? And then... And then you uh, you actually estimate a dollar cost for the savings accrued based by each of those cost containment initiatives, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, as a percentage of premium, what uh, what effect would can, can you can you translate those dollar amounts into a percentage of premium, or are they de minimis? That is, are they so small that it really doesn't affect the premium? I mean, I think, I think it's it's not negligible. MVP, I I don't know the exact number, but I would say right now our proposed premiums are somewhere between two hundred and seventy and three hundred million for Vermont is is the number I would say. Um, don't quote me on that, but it's in that ballpark. So if you if you look at the the pharmacy initiatives that are reducing between the two markets, roughly eight hundred a little over eight hundred thousand. I mean, that's a decent, you know, that's like a quarter of a percent, third of a percent. I mean, it's not, it's not a ton, but it's, it's not negligible. Exactly the, uh, you exactly answered the question. Could you uh, turn to the l &E report? And this will be the last document I'll ask you about. Exhibit 12. And go to page 15, Mr. Carnegie and you had a, little discussion about some of the data there. Yes. Okay. And I remember you you, you testified, didn't you, that uh, Vermont, that MVP lost about 30, 30 million on its Vermont individual and small group business this year? On our, on our annual financial statements, yes. Okay. Or, or, was it, not that it makes a big difference, but was it 30 million or was it 96% of 30 million? It was it was thirty million in Vermont and thirty two million in total. Okay, but la last year though you remember don't you that on your New York business you lost forty two million bucks and you made money in Vermont, right? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's not the case, is it, that Vermont that 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 uh, Vermont that, that MVP has been burdened by in Vermont year after year, correct? MVP has lost money in Vermont on average over the past several years, but I, I wouldn't say it not to the extent that 2021, that's correct. And it made money last year, right? I mean, it made money in 2020, right? Correct. On, on Vermont business. Okay, can you look at the table uh, showing the decline in RBC ratio on page 15 from 433 to in 2019 to 354 in 2021? Yes. Okay. You're not saying, are you, that 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 whole decline is due to losing 30 million on uh, on the uh, Vermont individual and small group business in 2021? I'm not. That that is a very big de decline, and I'm not saying that that's solely attributable. What I the point I was trying to make is our change in surplus impacted by our profit was 32 million, of which the 96% came from Vermont. So my point was it can and does impact RBC. I, I am not making the statement that it's the sole contributor of the call it 55, you know, 55 or 75 percent decrease. A point taken, right. Oh, so, so yeah, there's a 75 point decline in RBC between 2020 and 21. And do you know what is responsible for that decline? Nope, it could it could be several factors, um, such as obviously lower capital. So that of of our losses, that's one. We did have continual 
as to your point earlier, if you grow membership, your RBC without new capital will go down. We have grown in the Medicaid market in New York um, pretty consistently across 2021. Every month we were adding members due to the federal government or the state turned off recertification. So members didn't have to prove they're eligible anymore. They could just stay on Medicaid. So we did gain members month over month without a new capital infusion would result in a slightly lower RBC. So there's several things adding into that. I don't, I can't give you a percentage of how much each one is impacting it. Are you guys MVP in the Medicare Advantage business? Yes. Okay, and do you know whether your Medicare Advantage business was responsible for uh, any of the 75 point decline? I do not. Okay. I do not think, I, I will state that we were not highly profitable or unprofitable in Medicare Advantage in 2021 to the extent that Vermont was. Vermont was our biggest loser across the board. In 2021? Yes. But in 2020, New York was a much bigger loser, right? Correct. Well, New York, yes, driven by largely two of our markets where I believe Matt Lombardo alluded to anti-selective um, issues going on, which we have since corrected. Oh. You see, you stated earlier, you correct me if I'm wrong, I wrote this down. I think you made the statement, trend goes up every year. Do you, uh, do you recall making that statement? And if you did, do you stand by that statement? Medical trend, meaning the cost of a given service in one year to the next, in my five years and all the years I've heard about before, increases. What now, I, I, should, I should say that costs don't necessarily go up. Like COVID, for example, reduced costs and costs went down in 2020. That does happen. But if I were to go for an MRI in 19 and an MRI in 20, the 20 MRI on average would be more expensive. There are just less of them that happened. Would it surprise you to know that in the 1990s, when the Clinton health plan was being considered, that trend was negative in many markets? I don't have any reason to believe what you're saying is false. I would love for that to be the case. I have no more questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Pontiff. Thank you. Ms. Belleville, do you have any questions for Mr. Pontiff before we turn it over to the board? I do, uh, just a few. Good morning. Morning. Um, I, want, I wanted to uh, go back to uh, Oh, I'm hearing an echo, so I'm going to show my door. Sorry. That'll be better. Um, going back to the COVID vaccine uh, testimony you gave, you stated earlier that insurance companies, including MVP, have been responsible for the administrative costs of the COVID vaccine. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. Um, the, I, I guess I should, I, I should say for the ones we've been billed for. There has been several that have been administered, lots that have been administered that we just have not been billed for. So did MVP pay administrative fees for its members that were vaccinated at the mass vaccination sites? We we did not receive a bill. We have not paid anything. Um, so... I'm just, I'm just thinking of my own experience when I went for a vaccine at a mass vaccination site. I did present my insurance card. Um, did you, were you billed for any of the mass vaccination site vaccines when insurance information was given? We were not. And, and anecdotally, I had that same experience when in New York, when we went, I did present my insurance card. It was part of the requirement. And then I believe there was a time period where they determined like there were FEMA funds set aside to pay for some of it. And then they couldn't they couldn't figure out how to bill it. Do they just send a, you know, a, an invoice for all the things because they don't have claims systems and 
it ended up being MVP has not received a bill and does not expect to receive a bill for any mass vaccination sites. And, and consequently, that's how we get to our 37%. We don't, we don't have a record. So I, don't, I wouldn't even know if, if you were an MVP member, if you were vaccinated via mass vaccination or just not vaccinated. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. No more questions. Thank you. Now we'll turn it over to the board for questions, starting with board member Lunge. Thank you. Um, hi, Mr. Pontiff. Uh, nice to meet you. Yes, yeah, good to meet you too. Um, I want to ask you some questions about 2021 experience. Um, did you do any comparison of the 2021 experience to, for example, 2019 or earlier years? In general, in general, yes. Yes, we did. And could you tell me how it compared to, for example, 2019? Yeah, so what we've seen is a sharp increase in utilization. And it's it it's general like our our unit it's utilization and I should say intensity. So there's we generally see three components. We we like to think about medical costs and three components: utilization trend, medical trend, unit cost trend, I should say, which is just the cost of a given service and intensity. Utilization compared so 2020, we all know utilization went down. In 2021, it came back up, but it's come up at a rate that if you do a two-year utilization tr annualized trend 21 over 19 still gives you a number that is a number we haven't seen before so it's it's a it's a comeback and then continue to go up um situation also the unit costs look fine so you know what the board has approved at the hospitals we've checked that that's all in line there's nothing happening there but a lot of what we're seeing is intensity so something like a an er visit for example if if we had 10% of our ER visits were level three in 2019. Now it may be 15 or level three, and it keeps that ratio up. So we have more of in, we have increased utilization at increased intensity kind of procedures or services, which that's how you get, that's how we're arriving at these huge claim costs. Um, so it's, it's kind of twofold and it's, it's difficult it's difficult to control intensity. That's one, you know, a lot of it is controlled by the provider. Um, and we are trying, you know, I can give you some information that we're trying to put, especially surrounding ER specifically, policies in place to better require proof for, okay, if you need to go ER level five, which we assume is like, you know, you might not make it almost, you, you better have proof for that because that reimburses at $1,500 where a three is $500. So that's a big difference. So could you just speak a little bit more to the policy changes you're anticipating that might help curb some of that intensity issue? Understanding yes. that's difficult to do. Correct. Yeah. So we're we're just analyzing um, what I would call provider coding. So um, you know, in in a lot of these services are not, it's not your, okay, I, you know, I have sepsis, I'm in the hospital for three months and I have a million dollar claim, those are going to happen. They're going to continue to happen and they cost generally what they cost. It's more like we had 12,000 ER visits last year that all cost incrementally some value. And it's very hard to review every single one of them. Sure. And, and so we're trying to put policies in place where we can use, um, you know, use data to autonomously give some sort of either, uh, immediate down coding. So they would, if they give it, if they do a four, a level four, but it doesn't justify the um, criteria in our policy, it would get automatically paid as a three, something like that. So we're trying to review and we're still, I would say we're still in the, the stages of working through the different areas that these are happening in and trying to create and implement these policies. We have to vet them and it, it obviously, um, it varies by facility, as you probably know. Some facilities are percent of charges reimbursements. Some are paid on procedure codes. So, yeah. some, if it's percent of charges, it may not even matter, right? So, how do you alter that? And how do you? So, we're working through all that. I would say we're in like the first third of it, but we're we're really trying to make a push to um, implement new policies to curb what I would call. I don't want to say it's unnecessary intensity because that pushes blame to somebody, but it's just to make sure that it's it's legitimate. Thank you. 
Are you aware that there is a cyber attack in late 2020 at UVMMC? I was, yes, or I am, yes. Did you do any analysis to uh, potentially isolate the impact of deferred care from 2020 that happened in 2021 as a result of that cyber attack? We didn't do anything specifically on UVMC, but I can say that we looked at claim seasonality, you could say, and did not see um, did not see a huge ramp up that would warrant an adjustment, but we did not look at UVMC specifically around that time period. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I do have some questions on confidential materials that I will hold um, until for an executive session, uh, just to alert our hearing officer. Um, and I did have a couple other questions um, since we're getting to know you. Uh, so do you work on New York filings as well or just Vermont filings? I do work on New York. This I've worked on New York large group for the past couple of years in, in a management role. And in this year, um, early January 2022, I was shifted into my current role, which is now all of New York filings, including the small and individual markets, which I did prepare this year, but prior to this year, I was not involved in the preparation of those small individual rate filings in New York. Thank you. Um, and I think that's actually all the questions I have that aren't related to confidential materials. So thank you very much, Mr. Ponen. Thank you. Okay. Board member Walsh, do you have questions? Mr. Pontiff? Yeah, did you say board member Walsh? I did, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, Mr. Pontiff, nice to meet you. Yes, you uh, too. I'd like to go back to the COVID discussion, if, you, if we could, for a moment. Um, did you model um, a range of infection rates across the population? Infection rates, no. We modeled, everything we modeled was around data we had on claims um, because it's hard, it's very hard for us with our data to know anything about infections outside of, you know, publicly available documentation, which may not help us that much. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's difficult to model for sure. Um, I tried to do some just back of the envelope things while we were in that part of, of the testimony. Um, because I understood that um, your expenses could go up $60 over the 40 that have just been administ administrative. That's what I understood from that part of the testimony. So if everybody in Vermont, there's 650,000 people in Vermont, if every single one got vaccinated, that'd be $39 million. But not all that vaccine is going to prevent some hospitalizations. All right, so six, about 60% with the latest variant, about 60% of a population gets infected. The vaccines, according to recent research with, through JAMA and others, prevent about 56% of hospitalizations. So to, to recoup the, the 39 million, you'd have to pre prevent 200 hospitalizations if the average hospitalization is $200,000, which is also something from JAMA. So out of that size of a population, it would say that the, the prevented hospitals would be a savings to what you would have to pay out without the vaccines. So I point that out just because there was a long discussion about how having to pay for the vaccines could increase your expenses, the company expenses, but it would actually save in the long run. Um, I'd like to turn next to affordability. Right? Um, in the affordability discussion, I had hoped to ask like how you assessed affordability and get some more detail about it. 
Um, but you said at one point near the while you're summing it up that you felt that the rate increases were affordable because it's a good balance between the the cost of the service and the products and the benefits. And I just I just want to point out um, on record and listen, that's not a great way to assess affordability. I'd like to think of affordability like I think about Jeeps. I drive a 10 year old Jeep. I'd love a new one. I'd like an electric one, right? And it may be that the cost of the supplies and the labor to make an electric Jeep versus what I get from driving it, there could be a good balance between those. But I can't afford the Jeep. Right? The cost of that is too big a percentage of my income. And we don't have good assessments of affordability for Vermonters with the rate increases that we're looking at. The best estimates we do come from the Vermont Health Insurance Survey, which was argued at the beginning of the day that it should not be included. So I hope that it is, and I hope that we can have more discussion about affordability. We don't have good measures this year. We're not going to be able to fix it, We're not going to be able to have those discussions this year, but we need a better measure, probably multiple measures of affordability. We've got over 70 pages of public comments about people telling us they won't be able to afford these increases and they will either become uninsured or not go to the doctor. That brings me back to the same thing with COVID vaccines. Seeing your primary care doctor regularly helps prevent bad things from happening later. People not taking their medicines or not going to the doctor to, to see less expensive providers often lead to greater sicknesses later. We, I hope we get those things into our models in the coming years. Thank you. Okay, uh, board member Holmes, do you have questions for Mr. Pontiff? I do, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Mr. Pontiff. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. Yeah, I appreciate thank you. your testimony so far, it's very clear. Uh, but I do have some questions for you. Um, as we as we know, and you've alluded to or even been very clear on, this is a pretty unprecedented year in terms of expected increases in pharmaceutical drug prices, hospital rates, clearly monthly insurance premiums. My question to you is, is it possible, even likely, that people facing these higher premium rates may drop metal levels, thereby facing greater cost sharing and utilize less? I would say that is certainly possible and for some likely yes buy down is certainly something that is perpetuated by the continued increase in, in healthcare costs where yes people have to get lower benefits to keep their same premium level and even within a meta level isn't it possible probably likely that patients may utilize less as they face higher out-of-pocket costs due to these higher medical prices? Yes, and that's it's it's difficult because it's it's twofold on that one is that's like the intention of a high deductible plan is to make people take some of the costs into their own hands so there's not overutilization. But for the um the people who aren't don't have high incomes or are just low income in general, it puts that pressure on them where you feel like you can't go because you can't get you you don't want to pay for the care you need because you can't afford it. I appreciate that. Um, so it's twofold because the high deductibles are meant to do good, but they can do inadvertent bad to certain subsets of the population. Yes. Yeah. So in exhibit 35, um, if you could turn to that on page two, um, I guess my question to you is based on your testimony so far, why does your utilization assumption stay the same before and after the updated hospital budget information is incorporated? 
as you just said, these are historically large increases in unit costs that are probably going to have an impact on people's decisions about whether to seek care, when to seek care, how much care to seek. If you look at the outpatient alone, um, it's going from a 5% increase in those unit costs to a almost 14% increase in unit costs after the hospital budget submissions were considered, but you didn't change your utilization assumption at all. Can you talk to us about that? Yes, well, I, I would first say that I believe the ask was just to quantify the proposed hospital budget, so we did not, we did not consider that. Um, and secondly, I would say it's a valid thing to consider. This year, I think we are stuck in that difficult position where our utilization data, as I spoke to Jay about, is just, it, it's not credible. So um, we would we would have to rely on, and it's it's reasonable to rely on a, a external independent source of is there is there a study between that links buy down to lower utilization rates and assuming that that is well founded, it's it's a reasonable assumption that could be made. We did not do it because historically this exhibit is meant to quantify the hospital budgets themselves, not not an update to our rating methodology. Okay, well, I guess my my request then that we can add sometimes there is, there is um, post hearing follow up would be for you to consider the impact of these unprecedented uh, prices on your utilization assumptions, factoring in you know buy down and factoring in you know price elasticity of demand, people's responsiveness to these rather large historical rate increases on utilization. Of um, course, yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, for the past five years, how have your actual admin costs compared to your projected admin costs at the time of filing? And if I missed that in the submitted materials, I guess I would say that is fine to follow up in a post hearing, you know, data as well. If I've missed it. Yeah, I I don't think you did miss it. I know it's an exhibit. It's, it's not an, ex I shouldn't say exhibit. It's a document that we have together somewhere. So it's very easy to put together for you but it's not in evidence here, so I, I don't want to speculate on it, but we can certainly follow up. Great, thank you so much. Um, on exhibit 16, uh, page 13, you state at, at the, I guess it's the second full paragraph, the first sentence there, MVP has various online cost transparency tools for our members to help steer members towards affordable and quality care. Uh, I'm curious if you could address what metrics are display, displayed on that online tool to indicate level of quality for a facility or a provider. How are we steering members specifically towards quality care in that cost transparency tool? Sure, I, I in, in, I don't want to miss the, abuse the word here, but in full transparency, I personally have not used this tool to seek my own care, so I, I am not sure the quality metrics, whether it's it's a we have a we have a high performing network of providers that we have graded based on. Uh, we have ETG methodology where we rank provide where we look at episodes of care. So such as you had a, you know, a, a transplant or something like a wrist surgery. Right. And it looks at all wrist surgeries across all providers and their cost for the whole episode, not just the surgery, but how many post-op visits do they drag you into? How many you know, pre-op visits that they make you do where they get you for 250 bucks a, a visit, right? Like how much of that happens? What's the cost of the episode? And then we kind of rank percentile. This is a high performing, um, you know, a high, when I say performing provider, it's, it's, it's providing the quality services at the lower cost. So the quality metrics in total, like what we're actually using as metrics, I, I don't have the exact uh, data on that. And, and I can, give you, this was um, our marketing team and um, they they work very closely with this and, and trying to educate on it. I just don't have the exact figures for what the quality is and I'm happy to give that to you, but I know that that's, that's, that's the outline of it. Yeah, if you could follow up with what uh, a member in Vermont sees on that cost transparency tool related to quality, that would be really helpful. Um, as a, as a follow-up to that, actually, I did go on the MVP website and um, poke around a bit 
And one of the things on the website, it says is MVP has established the MVP provider excellence program. Perhaps that's what you were referring to. Yes. Uh, to provide our physicians and members relevant quality and cost data to help them make informed healthcare decisions. The purpose of this new program is to identify and recognize high quality, cost efficient providers. But unfortunately, the next line down on the website is this is only available for in-network participating providers that are contracted with MVP in New York State. Those are the only providers that are actually evaluated under that program. So unless I'm missing something, no Vermont providers are included in that program. So why, or if I'm correct in that, and I apologize if I'm incorrect in that, but that is what the website says, only providers that are contracted in New York State with MVP in New York State are evaluated. Uh, why are you not providing the same evaluation of Vermont providers? Totally valid question. I don't think you are mistaken the, if that's what the website says. I. Now, what I will say is that's great feedback, and and I did not know I did not know that the website said that. I would um, I believe that program is used on some New York large group plans where we have things that, if you go to one of those providers, you may be able to get a differentiated cost share. Then, like you may get a thirty dollar copay instead of a fifty dollar copay if you go to a high quality, high cost or low cost sorry provider. Um, I don't think that's uh, we can't do that. I don't think in the the ACA market have like tiered tiered benefits, or we don't. Um, so I don't know what what I will follow up and get clarification is. I don't know if the Vermont pro providers are not evaluated at all, or if they are not part of the program because it's it's meant to adjudicate benefits for the New York benefit plans. That is clarification I can provide. But either way, I agree, and it's. Feedback I will provide that we sh we should be doing it for MVP's full service area. There's no reason we should. And then, can you confirm that none of the administrative costs of designing or mounting that provider excellence program are allocated to Vermont members right now? I cannot confirm that. That's done by our fin our allocations are done by our financial planning and analysis team. Okay, so it'd be helpful to just con with your financial analysis team could confirm that because if the Vermont members Certainly. are not getting the benefit of that, they shouldn't be paying for that program. Certainly. Um, are there any other general services marketed on your website uh, that are provided to New York members only, not to Vermont members that you can think of? Not that I'm aware of. I, I know we have, we have our GIA, which is our our app, our mobile app, which where you can get um, for all non qualified, for all non high deductibles, you can get first dollar telemedicine care, twenty four seven, you know, psychiatry, urgent care, PCP kind of intervention, all that stuff, first dollar. Um, that's available to the whole MVP service area. In twenty twenty three, we're rolling out a a virtual PCP through it through a new vendor. Um, and that will be available to all of MVP service area. I don't know of any other specific programs that are just New York only. Okay. Um, do you think, so if, if you can just confirm that in your follow-up that there's nothing else that's, that's a general service that seems to be marketed to MVP members that is not directly also available for Vermont members. Um, would you agree that MVP could improve costs and increase the quality of care for Vermonters by taking a more active role in helping Vermont members steer towards higher quality, low cost providers? I think in general that is true and that is the, the goal, yes. Promoting, pushing members into, I shouldn't say pushing, uh, you know, shifting members into low cost, high quality care is the goal, should be the goal of every insurer and is is a key step to reducing healthcare costs. Yes, I agree. Um, in exhibit 17, uh, page three, in response to um, question four about several of the cost initiatives, uh, and you've spoken a little bit about this with Mr. Angoff, um, but you did state there that there were Two to three hundred thousand dollars of expected cost savings from the coding and implant initiatives that were not reflected in the filings. Um, are there? 
you know, I guess it would be helpful. I, I understand it might not be a lot, but what would that premium in, impact be? And more importantly, are there any other cost savings initiatives that the actuarial team learned about after the file was submitted in, in the same way that these two uh, cost initiatives were identified post-filing from, from your management team? Yeah, so so I'll I'll answer the first the first part first. In the two, roughly two hundred thousand, I think would translate to somewhere between uh, a tenth, seventy five basis points and a tenth of a percent. You know, um, on on the rate for both markets, uh, maybe split a little bit differently. It's it's again, it's not nothing, right? Two hundred thousand is two hundred thousand. That's a lot of money. Um, and yes, we did check with our when this came up, I will be honest with you, when this came up, the actuarial team was like, hey, why weren't we told about this, right? Like, this this is our job to price the plans, We, you know, keep us in the loop. And so we did at that point check with them. Is there anything else we need to inform the board about or go go about adjusting our rates for? The answer was no, there's nothing. There's no other estimated savings at, the, at that time. Obviously, as we put in our answer, we continue, we're constantly, you know, I say we as MVP are constantly evaluating those things and, and trying to come up with cost savings anywhere we can. But these, what, what we've talked about here are the ones that we have, you know, estimates for and are, are, you know, ready to reduce the rates for. So yes, and I am in agreement that the 200,000, we were not informed about until after our submission of the rate filing and is a gap. Great. Um, well, I very much appreciate all your answers to my questions, and I will really appreciate the follow-up that you've agreed to do on those questions that you were unable to answer today. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Board Member Pelham, do you have questions? I do. Um, good afternoon. Oh, it's still morning. Uh, good, good morning, Chris. Is it Chris, Chris or Christopher? Chris is good. Very good. So my first question is just to kind of walk from where we started to where we are now. And we started with the original filing, um, you know, as was noted today, uh, with the small group um, up 16.6% uh, and the in, in, uh, individual up 17.37%. And we've now migrated to 24.78% um, and 24.54% respectively. So I'm just trying to get a sense of the dollar value of that, not just the percentage or the per member per month. But um, so is this a fair calculation that in your SIR filings with the original um, uh, the original SIR filings, um, you were uh, saying, well, you stated that the um, premium increase would be $24 million for the small group and $21 million and change for the um, individual. So would it be a fair mathematical exercise to, for example, design, divide the small group current 2478 uh, by the 16.6 and multiply that by the premium increase um, originally submitted to get a sense of um, how, how, much, how much aligning ourselves you know, with the hospital budgets is is being passed to to uh, premium payers. Yes, I think that's a reasonable approximation. Okay, so if you do that, your original submission was um, over over on a combined basis was forty five million dollars, and now uh, we're about twenty million dollars higher at sixty five million dollars. Um, that's that's where that math takes us, which is you know some big numbers. So, um, so where we are now, uh, the rates that we're looking at now are rates that are based on um, the hospital budget submissions. That's correct. What they've requested in terms of commercial, you know, commercial payments or you know, commercial revenues. Correct. I believe for all hospitals outside of the UVM network, they just provided the one number to the increase to the charges. UVM made a, a specific distinction that their commercial rate increase would go up more than the charges. And so we reflected that figure, but yes. Okay, 
So we, we might have a little difference here. I had a much more simple approach. I got inspired yesterday to, to go and look at all the hospital budgets on file at the Green Mountain Care Board and to go to the payer mix table, which is for reference, and I'll send you the spreadsheet. Um, it's uh, page four of seven of the hospital submissions. And there, there is a breakdown of um, revenues by payer, by uh, Medicaid, by commercial, um, and uh, it ties out to the uh, net uh, pre present revenue. So it ties out to the dollar. All of this kind of, it's, it's, it's you know, all the, the bad debt and all that stuff is washed away. And these, these are the actual revenues that, um, and um, so I was looking at that and uh, I created a little spreadsheet for all uh, 14 hospitals and the total amount for 23 budget which would include your increases here, um, was uh, $1.859 billion, um, and that was a 20.1% uh, increase over 2022 projected, the, the most recent number we have. And so the net ch the, the change, the dollar change, is uh, $318 uh, million dollars, um, across all hospitals uh, collectively. Um, of that, um, 223 million, 223.7 million is aligned with the UVM Medical Center budget, uh, which is 70% of the total. And um, for the network, um, it's uh, 251.8 million. Uh, so it's 79% of the total. And so a couple of questions in that arena. Um, given the scale, I mean, it seems to me looking at these numbers, one of the reasons why we're here is uh, is UVM Medical Center and the network. That absent, you know, those increases, uh, we wouldn't be in a severe a, a position. And I'm just wondering if um, um, if 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 two things. I'm wondering how that might affect how this how the revenues that you're receiving. Um, from these premium increases get um, uh, um, uh, spent basically through the fee-for-service system because it's a fee-for-service system out there that's going to kind of draw this money, you know, um, from you to, to uh, the providers. And, um, you know, does, does how, how, how do small hospitals or independent providers, you know, get treated when there's this you know, one big one big entity that is is uh, and a powerful entity uh, that's kind of, that's kind of driving the reason why we're here and, and facing these increases. Yes, that that is a certainly a reasonable question. I can't uh, say I'm familiar with the the financials of of UVM or the the math behind their proposal, but what I can say is that. UVM is as you know. I, I don't want to say exact numbers because I don't have it. It's I believe it's in a confidential exhibit. But UVM as a percentage of our outpatient or inpatient spend is large, right? So I think it it does it, it is factual to say impacting them by a percent is not the same impact on rates as impacting a smaller hospital by a percent, right? It's you impact all hospitals by a percent, it's uniform to everybody, but it may impact a certain hospitals differently. So it, it very much does fluctuate and UVM is our big, you know, the, the main reason for our rates going up so much is I believe they had the highest increase at 19.9 for a commercial rate in, increase, which we then passed, you know, passed through as a big portion of our claims. So yes, I, I don't, I can't comment or, you know, speculate on what should be done. Um, but I do know, I, I am agreeing with you that they are a large portion and what is done to them is not necessarily indicative of, you know, what is done to what should be done to other hospitals or vice versa. And it does impact rates differently. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just worried about it a little bit. I don't know what to do about it, but, um, yet anyhow, but I, you know, it is a UVM medical center is a 27% increase over their uh, 2022 projected, and uh, it's it's a big number, 223 million dollars. So um, 
I just I just worry about kind of the smaller fish in Vermont Sea uh, kind of getting uh, pushed aside a little bit, not because purposefully, but just just by the scale of stuff here. Um, so here's a hypothetical. Um, what happens if, as we go through the hospital budget process, and uh, you know, it just gets too difficult to um, swallow these increases? Um, I mean, as uh, the other Tom said, we've gotten pages and pages and pages, you know, of comments this year. Um, you can't uh, uh, walk away from the fact that a 24%, 25% increase in premium is small or reasonable or moderate. I mean, it, 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 it's a big, heavy lift. And so um, one of the things I was looking at in terms of the UVM budget is that for their 22 uh, projected um, operating margin, both um, operating margin and non-operating margin combined, um, and you can see it on their balance sheet and on their income statement, uh, they're on the whole $130 million projected for 2022. Um, and they move um, to uh, 2023 um, to a $56 million combined margin um, surplus. So they go from a negative 7.9% margin to a positive 2.8% margin. And what if we say, um, well, gee, this just seems to be too rushed, too crammed. Um, we we definitely have to help UVM Medical Center get out of the hole they're in, but um, but we can do it over say two years or three years, you know, and uh, which would give more time for the reforms they might be pursuing to, you know, take hold and uh, save money. It might give um, uh, ratepayers a, a more manageable. Um, uh, you know, uh, pay, you know, a kind of payment obligation. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering how all this relates, because if we approve your rates and then we go through the hospital budget process and, um, you know, uh, we exercise a little bit of, I mean, I, I can go back in my experience in the early 90s, and it took us four or five years to work out of the, the recession and prior governors, uh, you know, Left leftover fiscal issues, and and I'm looking at this and thinking, well, maybe this isn't something that can be solved in a year, can reasonably solved in a year, and uh, we might need to structure our processes so that it happens over a two or three year period. Is that um, what? What's your gut reaction to that idea? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess I will say I I don't want to. I, I don't want to speculate on, again, what the board should be doing to any given facility. But what I will say is that MVP does believe that at the end of the day, we just want our rates to, our premium rates to reflect the expectation and or the approved hospital budgets. I know that's that's part of the difficulty of this timing every year is the budgets aren't known until after. I don't, I don't know the laws. I don't, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know any of those things about like, if that if you decide that after the fact, is there a retroactive true up or can you can is that even permissible via the board? I don't know. What I what I do know in in hope is just that MVP just wants the rates to match the budget. So if if you approve fully UVMC, we would want that reflected. If you give them nothing and say figure it out, mm -hmm. we would want that reflected. So yeah. it, it it doesn't we're we we are all for lower healthcare costs in in the system and in making the member experience better and trying to reduce premiums for the members. But our first go, our goal first and foremost is to protect solvency as a company, and that would be done through just making sure the hospital budgets are aligned with the premium rates, whatever they end up being. Well, that's uh, I mean one one thought, and maybe, maybe this is a, is 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 not a, a good thought, but one thought is that. I've watched this debate for the last couple of years between your competitor um, and UVM about fixed perspective payments. And uh, one of the parties says we don't have any willing partners, and the other and the other says um, I'd be they'd be first in line, uh, you know, for fixed perspective payment. That's not something that can be done in a year. It might take, you know, if if all of a sudden that logjam gets broken, it might take a year or two years or so. And uh, but would not be factored into in, into the kind of current decision making. Um, another area that uh, when I was uh, putting together the spreadsheet, 
I did kind of uh, keep the Medicaid totals too, just to see the comparison. And so for 2023 budget year over 2022 uh, um, projected year, uh, the actual Medicaid number went down across all hospitals, i.e. hospital finance people don't expect anything um, more. Um, in fact, they expect less than what they received um, by 2%. So it's a negative 2%. And if you go to the JFO's website and you look at their five-year global commitment trend, um, um, it's a, a negative 0.4% trend over those five years. And so my question in this arena is, you know, uh, how how is MVP engaged in any effort to have the Medicaid program um, keep pace at least with some modest inflation rate, as um, but certainly isn't it isn't isn't in the negative arena. Yeah, so I can't speak exactly to provider by provider contracting in terms of Medicaid rates. I know that the Medicaid fee schedule is something that is set either is set by the government. I, I'm not sure if it's federal or if it's state, but it's it's a government set fee schedule. And that's why I know those don't generally get the updates and, and it does result in a leveraged impact of commercial rate payers subsidizing Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I, I always, in, a, a little like in my personal life, I always liken it to if you if you go to the doctor and it, you know you see not accepting Medicaid patients or not accepting Medicare patients, people always ask me like, why is that? Well, it could just be, you know, the the reimbursement the reimbursement could be drastically different, like significantly different for Medicaid versus Medicare versus commercial, and it results in and I think the hospitals, most all the hospitals call it out in their budget, so it's no secret that in order for them to get back to a increase of call it four percent, commercial has to pay a leveraged impact to that. Whether that's fair or not is is obviously not my my arena, but it is something where the the government does not update or does not increase the the, the government run programs fee schedules at the same rate that the hospitals want in total, and so well, it I creates think, that subsidization. I am just give me two seconds to look here, but I think those are the kind of key questions I was concerned about. Um, the sequencing of rate review first, hospital budget second is 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 deeply problematic. And I, I just wonder if there's some kind of like, given the scale of these rate increases, you know, and the magnitude of them, if there's something that we, some, you know, that we can structure that can flatten this out a little bit. So it's a little bit more manageable for everybody. And it gives our provider system time to, um, um, uh, it, um, it gives them time to implement reforms that I doubt that they could implement in just a, a one-year budget cycle. So thank you for your time and effort, and uh, I'll pass you along to our esteemed chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair, do you have questions? I do. Um, good morning, Mr. Pana. If I, I'd like to say uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, but I feel like we've met before. I, I did. Uh, I stepped in for, I believe, one question in the executive session last year that Matt did not have the uh, did not have the answer to. So he he tagged me in for that. So that you may remember me from there. Okay. <laughs> do your friends call you Your Holiness? No, no. <laughs> it, I do get it every now and then, but no. no. <laughs> is is Matt still with the company, or is he gone? Yes, Matt. Matt transitioned over into our growth and innovation department. So he got out of the actuarial role and wanted to focus more on um, expanding MVP as a company. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank you um, on for MVP actually doing business in Vermont and providing uh, Vermonters with, albeit a limited choice, a choice in in their. Uh, um, decisions on where to uh, buy their insurance. And uh, uh, on behalf of all Vermonters, thank you for that. And thank you for your uh, candor this morning. I very much look forward to seeing that uh, analysis on uh, the elasticity and uh, the price. There, there was a substantial difference in 
what was ultimately filed by hospitals in Vermont and what you originally um, projected. Um, you had mentioned that you're um, overseeing the New York uh, pricing as well. Have you seen that similar surprise in New York state or is this a Vermont phenomenon? So I, th I think the important distinction is Vermont, obviously the bulk, I don't know, 60, 70% of our dollars flow through Green Mountain Care Board jurisdiction hospitals. So there's like a formal budget process and all of that. I can tell you that in New York, our trends are in are just about what they have been every other year. So total medical plus pharmacy plus utilization is in the six to seven range, which is the same, you know, the same as Vermont has had historically. Um, so we, to my knowledge, we have not gotten or, I, and I shouldn't say gotten, I should say gotten and or negotiated a hospital to have very large increases in New York. I could be wrong on that. I'm not a contracting expert. But our, I, what I can tell you for sure is our rates do not reflect the sort of um, jump in expected facility costs that we're seeing come through the budgets in Vermont. That's true. So in your role overseeing pricing, um, are you just uh, um, providing information to the negotiators um, with the hospitals or are you actively engaged in those negotiations? We, we provide so it's it's a little bit of a two-way street. We provide them support in their data understanding of where our service is utilized. And you know, we we serve as like uh, there's a there's a couple departments within MVP that can serve as kind of data um, data providers to the to the network team. The network team specifically is who talks who who owns relationships with the hospitals and does the negotiating and and figures out what the increases are going to be, at which point they then come back to actuarial and say, Here's what we've negotiated. Here's what you should build into your rates. Yeah, it, it by, you know, on a facility by facility or and, and you know, inpatient outpatient physician basis. My colleagues have asked uh, all the questions that I really had. So that that's all that I had. I I didn't wasn't even sure if uh, Gary would let me ask you the question I just asked without uh, raising an objection, but I appreciate uh, his allowing me to ask that. So thank you. I I would never stand between the chair and a question. <laughs> okay, Mike, it's so, back to you. Um, and I think so. We need to get to potentially redirect, and then uh, it sounds like an executive session. And I'm wondering, Gary, if you have any preference on taking a 30 minute lunch break now, um, or do you want to do your redirect and then take a lunch break and come back and do the executive session at the end of the break? Or do you have any preference on how we? Uh, well, I, I would prefer to do my redirect after the confidential session, just so then I can, if there's any redirect on the confidential, I can do it in that and then we come out and I do any other redirect. I will say at this point, I have no redirect on the questions that have been asked so far. Um, and as to a lunch break, um, I'll defer to you and the, the chair on that. Uh, my bladder may not, but I'll defer to you on that. Um, Mr. Chair, do you have a preference on going into executive session now or at the tail end of a lunch break? I. I think that uh, it doesn't matter as long as it's uh, tied to the lunch break so that uh, the public doesn't have to uh, um, try to guess when we might be coming back. So, I think it should be fairly quick. I didn't hear a lot of board members that expressed that they had questions about confidential stuff so well robin said she had several so maybe we should just ask her how long she thinks she's going to need i don't think i'll need probably more than like 10 or 15 minutes i only have two or three questions i think i have one or two so okay so why don't we uh take a five minute bio break reconvene around at, at noon uh, 
and plan for a, about a half an hour executive session prior to lunch, and then we'll turn to Gary for any potential redirect he may have. Um, so we'll go back on record in uh, the in the matter of MVP health plans, 2023 individual and small group rate filing. Um, so board members, we, we went through this yesterday, um, but I'll just kind of recap. Uh, we do hold these hearings as part of a as part of a regular meeting or as part of an open meeting. Um, the open meetings law contains several different grounds that you can go into executive session. Uh, one of those grounds is to um, to discuss uh, material that's exempt from public inspection and disclosure under the Public Records Act. Uh, all the material in the binders that's been marked as confidential has already been reviewed. Um, uh, and found to be exempt under the Public Records Act. So you can go into executive session to uh, ask questions about that material. Um, and uh, we would need to prevent a discussion of, of that material from turning into a discussion of the general topics um, to which they pertain. So it really needs to be limited to uh, what's been marked as confidential in the exhibit binders. Um, and that's really the only basis I heard that there may be questions around. Um, any any questions for me about, about that before I suggest a motion? No, but uh, Mike, just to be clear, my questions are around the confidential material, but it may get into provider contracting because it's related to those sections of the confidential material. So I think I should uh, move under both grounds. Okay, that's good to know. Yep. So the the other ground, there's a there's a ground for going into executive session to discuss contracts. Um, provided that there's been a finding that uh, the information um, would cause a substantial disadvantage if if made public, um, a substantial disadvantage to, uh, you know, in this case, MVP. Um, so as long as the questioning is uh, specific to competitively sensitive provider contract negotiations, typically that's like, what do we expect terms to be? You know, what are the issues that arise in, in those negotiations? The how how do those issues get resolved? Um, those types of things uh, fall within that exception. So, um, I think the best way to go about it is to first um, make a finding that uh, public knowledge about the details of MVP's provider contract negotiations uh, would place MVP at a substantial disadvantage in those nego negotiations. And then uh, the second motion would be um, to go into executive session to take testimony about um, materials in the binders that's been marked as confidential as well as um, provider contracting. So would anyone like to move that the board find that uh, public knowledge of the details of MVP's provider contract negotiations would place MVP at a substantial disadvantage? I will move that uh, the board find that public knowledge of the details of MVP's provider contract negotiations would place MVP at a substantial disadvantage. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Please let the record reflect that that was a unanimous decision. And then the second motion uh, would be, would anyone like to move to go into executive session 
to take testimony about materials in the binders that's been marked as confidential and uh, the details of MVP's provider contract negotiations. I will so move. I will so second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Again, please let the record reflect that was a unanimous decision. Um, so, uh, we, as you guys know, we have a separate call line for the executive session. Um, Mr. Miller, is it possible to have uh, this? transcribed separately from the public portion of the hearing? Yes, we can do that just like we did with yesterday's. Great, thank you. So in terms of who needs to go uh, to the executive session, obviously the board members, the attorneys, um, I think really uh, anyone from MVP, healthcare advocate, the board, board staff, um, Yesterday we had DFR uh, on. I think that's, Gary, unless you feel differently, I think that's appropriate. Everybody oh, keeps like saying it. yesterday, but it, it, and it feels like it, but it was really Monday. <laughs> <laughs> that was gonna be my question. Did you go for two days? <laughs> it only felt like it. <laughs> no objection. <laughs> no objection. So DFR is welcome, and I think that covers us. So uh, in terms of time expectations, um, I figure we would go directly from the executive session to uh, the lunch break and then reconvene the public session after that. So I'm thinking, uh, quarter after one might be reasonable to return, um, but we can update, Christina, maybe we can just kind of update the, the notice that we put on the public session here. We can okay. do that. Great, so why don't we just put a uh, quarter after one for now and then update it as we need to. So anything else before we move over to the other line? I would appreciate it if you could just so we all go there properly, at least my team, tell us what we're doing. Where do we click? Uh, so click leave on this meeting. Um, there was an invite to, so it's on my calendar, so my team's calendar. Uh, just click join the confidential executive session one. And that should do it. <laughs>